Hello everyone, this is Elonzo. Want to know how to get your first cloud job? Then please register for our webinar. We'll teach you everything that you need to know and answer your questions along the way. Hope to see you there. Hello everyone, this is Elonzo. Want to know how to get your first cloud job? Then please register for our webinar. We'll teach you everything that you need to know and answer your questions along the way. Hope to see you there. My name is Richard Furr, and I can say I am cloud hired. That yes, come and join and get cloud hired. I'm cloud hired. I'm cloud hired. I'm cloud hired. Hey, go, go cloud architect family. I'm cloud hired. Well, I'm cloud hired, guys. So I'll just say I'm cloud hired. I'm cloud hired. I'm cloud hired thanks to go cloud architects. It worked for me. And now I'm cloud hired. Because because of Google Architect program, I am cloud hired. See! I am cloud hired. Thank you, Mike and the Glow Cloud team. Welcome everyone. Today we're here for our AWS Solutions Architect Associate Certification 2023. And this is a complete AWS full course tutorial where we're gonna focus on the AWS Solution Architect Certification. This is free AWS certification training. It is an AWS certification online training. The reason we do these free AWS courses is because we want you to have the best opportunities in your life. I've been an architect now for more than 25 years, and I've helped people build their technology careers, get their first tech job, get promoted for more than two decades. 
and I really want to help you build an elite cloud computing career. Now, we absolutely love helping people obtain their careers, and it's nearly every day now where someone says, Mike, I just got cloud hired, and that's why we're here. Now, we're going to do this course a lot differently than many other exams, and we're going to do it for a reason. Prior to starting this company, I had interviewed 1,000 AWS certified people, and they had at least one AWS certifications, in many cases, 10 of them, and many of them, like two-thirds of them, had passed the AWS Certified Solutions Architect Professional, and none of them were hireable, not a single one. They all knew the name of an AWS service. They all knew how to configure it, but none of them knew what they were. People would call me up and say, I set up an EC2 instance. Mike, what is it? Now, the reason that's challenging is as a hiring manager, here's what I do to determine how I hire you. I interview you and see how you explain the technology to me, which is what is the tech? How does the tech work? And why should a company use this? So in this boot camp, in this free AWS Solutions Architect boot camp, which is, a, a, and which is gonna be intro level cloud architect training, we're gonna teach you how the technology works and that's gonna separate you from those that are hireable and from those that are not from those that are paid more and from those that are not. And that's why we're gonna do this. But we've got a couple things to make this week so much more meaningful for you. For you. We have a 100% completely free AWS exam guide, which is gonna cover most of the Solution Architect Associate and Professional all in a free book my team wrote for you. It's completely free. My team's gonna pop it in the chat box, go get it. This companion book goes along with our free AWS certification training. Now, I know it's not enough for you to just watch someone talk and watch videos to get there. So we're going to do two things to make this a special event for you. We're going to present for about 20 minutes, and then we're going to answer your questions for 20 minutes. And tonight, we're going to make sure you have a better opportunity, too. We're going to invite you to a free Zoom session, and you can ask any questions you have in Zoom. We can have a face-to-face -face conversation. I want to make sure that when you're done this week, this free AWS certification course, or the AWS Certified Solution Architect Associate 2023 course, all your questions are answered. So most nights we're gonna have a completely free Zoom session for an hour or two just to uh, answer your questions. My team will be scheduling that. The link on how to register for that is in the chat box because I want you to be great. And while we're at it, download the, I want you to come to our, uh, while you're at it, I want you to get the completely free guide on how to get your first cloud architect job. My team will pop the link to that. These are three resources that are gonna change your life and help you build an elite cloud computing career where you can get the jobs that you want if you, if you go through and develop all those skills and the how to become a cloud architect document. So that's what we're doing today. Now I am in South Florida. I see some of you have told me where you're at, but I wanna know where you're at. So tell me where you're at. While you're filling in, telling me where you're at, while you're getting all these free resources, take a minute, and share this video with the friend. It costs almost as much as a car to put on a production like this. By the time we have a staff of about 10 people and all the videography gear that we use. So I want to help as many people as possible. So please invite a friend. I'm here, over here, Ali Khan in Virginia. I know an Ali Khan from Cisco that's in that Virginia area. I wonder if you're related. So tell me where you're at. I'm loving this. I'm seeing where you guys are all from. And we will begin in one moment. While you're at it, hit the like button. If you're not a subscriber to the channel, subscribe to our channel and hit the bell so you'll be notified of all the free videos and all the free content we have to help you. Wow, I'm seeing Kenya, India, Philadelphia, that's where I'm from actually, South Africa, Nigeria, this is great. Uh, I've seen Cameroon, Costa Rica, Gainesville, Toronto. A lot of people in Philadelphia, Virginia, Texas, Calgary. I know a couple of you guys that are over there. This is just great. This is wonderful. You're all over. And that's what I like to see, a team all over the world collaborating to help out. So this is great. So now I know where you're from. Now give me a hashtag, AWS Solution Architect Associate. And then we'll begin. That way I know you're awake, alert, oriented. We're going to have lots and lots of fun. 20 minutes of presentation, 10 minutes of questions, and a bonus question and answer session almost every night this week. So let's make sure we help you build an elite career. I love this. Germany. That's where you've been from. El Salvador. Fantastic. Baltimore, Maryland, San Diego. Telephone, it's good to see you in RTP. And Truth Factory in Dallas. I love this. All over. 
Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Boca Raton, Florida. That's an area I know fairly well. All kinds of well. So love this. I see all these AWS Solutions Architect Associates that are there coming in there. Hopefully most of them are actually words and not acronyms, but I'm loving it. Sunny Brazil over there, uh, all over you, all over the world. So wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. So now let's have some fun. Let's begin. If we're going to talk about the AWS cloud, we have to think about how the cloud is actually organized. And we're going to get really deep into how it's organized. And before we begin, if you want to get to do some hands-on things, there are some wonderful AWS skill builders on the AWS website. Many of them are free, and they're also good supplemental information that we want you to get. Why? Amazon makes the exam. Amazon makes their skill builders. You take this, you take our book, you match it up with a skill builder and a great practice test. You're going to do wonderful on passing this exam. So let's talk about the cloud and how it's organized. So when we think of the cloud, the first thing we really need to understand is what is cloud computing? Well, there's just no mysterious cloud that's actually out there. All cloud computing really is, is renting space in somebody else's data center. And what exists in a data center? Networking gear like routers and switches, servers, compute, storage area networks, which will be block storage, object storage, file storage, physical load balancers, these hardware devices that exist out there, firewalls, intrusion detection, intrusion prevention systems, lots of space, lots of power and cooling. So that is all the AWS cloud is, the Azure cloud, the Google cloud, the Nutanix cloud, the OpenStack cloud. They are quite simply somebody else's network in a data center. Now the public cloud providers are huge versus a data center, which could be small or huge. So now at least we've defined what is cloud computing. AWS doesn't define it, so we need you to understand it. Because when you go to a customer, if you talk to them, they need you to know that you understand it. And what do we do mostly as cloud architects? We take the stuff from the network and the data center, we migrate it to the cloud. So understand, we're taking it from a physical data center to a virtual data center, and that's it. Same stuff, different names. So we're going to go into these concepts to make sure you understand it. So if we look at the AWS cloud, now we need to talk about how it actually is. And we're going to talk about regions. And here's the way I want you to think about a region, a huge geographic area like the United States or Australia that, or Europe. You can think of an area as a large geographic area, sometimes a continent, sometimes part of a continent. Tonight. Then we're going to talk about the concept called an availability zone, and I'll show you a picture about this in a minute. It's just a data center. So, for example, we might have a continent, and it might have 200 data centers in there. Each one would be an availability zone. I've exaggerated the number on purpose to make sure you understand it. Now, the next thing we'll talk about, and we're going to go lay much more depth into this, is something called the local zone. Look, I'll get to it in a minute, but here's the thing for you to remember. If I run the stuff in my data center that's next to me, the performance is good because there's no time to get there. But if I put my equipment on the public cloud and my server's on the public cloud and I'm a thousand miles away, there's latency. So guess what? The performance isn't as good. So a local zone will be a place that's closer to you in between you and the cloud and I'll get there and then we'll get into edge locations which are part of the cloud front content delivery network. So let's first actually look from an architecture perspective, what does this look like? As you can see, we have a very large geographic area. It's got this nice little green color. That's the region. And if you could see, we have these little boxes called availability zones. They're data centers. Now, normally speaking, here, here's the way this is going to work. You're going to have this giant area. You're going to have a bunch of data centers, and you're going to have high-speed networks between them. And that's all it's going to be, quite simply, and you'll be there. So large geographic area region, small geographic, little boxes, data centers inside the region. For those of you that have registered for the book, it could take 15 minutes for our servers to get it to you, so just keep that in mind. Now, let's talk about a local zone. So if there's a data center that's in between you and the cloud, now we're talking about a local zone, and I'll draw it out for you in a minute. But the key is it takes time to get to the cloud, which is why cloud performance is typically lower performance than the data center. 
and all the cloud providers have done the following. They've created a median data center between you and the cloud provider. I'll draw it out for you in a minute. And that keeps your latency down. So if you've got a latency sensitive application, what you need to do is you need to bring it towards you. Either put it in your data center, which is the cheapest and highest performance, or guess what? You can pop it in an intermediate data center. And I'll show you what that looks like in a minute. In an intermediate center, we create our subnets, which is where we put our stuff, like our EC2 instances, which are virtual machines, our load balancers, any kind of Kubernetes, what have you. And then we can set that up locally, and it's closer to us. Now, there are certain local zones which offer much more performance, even databases and, and, and things that are close. And uh, we can always take, in, in today's world, a private line or a direct connection to the local zone. So let me show you some uh, graphical representations. This is the way AWS would like to describe it to you. They tell you to set up a local zone where you enable it. You put your VPC in the local zone, and you would you'd run your low latency applications there. This doesn't mean a lot to me, so I'm going to put it in terms that I actually understand, and, and then I'm going to draw it out for you the way you can really understand it. But here you can see we've got a giant region, okay? And in this region, you know, we've got our data centers, and you can see right next to our data centers, we have something that looks like a local zone. And that's a data center on the way, but I still don't think that's going to be necessarily good enough for you. So what I want to do here is I want to draw it out for you. I'm going to give you guys a, a visual view so you can see it. Bear with me. I'm going to get a new slide here. And uh, let me just make sure that you can see if I make a shape. OK, perfect. So let's do this. Here I'm going to draw out for you. And here's the way I want you to think about this from an architecture perspective. Let's assume you have a data center over here. And this is your data center or your office or campus. It could be either one. And over here, along the way out, we've got your AWS or your Azure or your Google. It's the same thing. And what, I'm, what, the, what you really need to see is to go from here to here to this link, this might be two milliseconds. And two milliseconds of latency may be enough to cause problems for certain applications, especially if they're financial applications or high-performance applications. So to shave the two milliseconds off, you know, the point of the local zone is this. What you can do is you can have one call this, well, I'm going to call this local zone. You get yourself a connection to the local zone. And the local zone is going to be connected to the region. And now, poof, you put your high, your high performance things in that local zone or your data center. And then you can keep all the stuff that's less important where performance doesn't matter as much inside of the AWS cloud and leverage its scalability uh, and the such. So we covered regions, large geographic area, availability zones, data centers, and the next thing we talked about local zone, which is another data center near you. Now the last part of the AWS cloud and how it's organized is gonna be the edge location. Now the edge location is where the CloudFront content delivery network exists. And Edge, and we're going to talk a lot about content delivery networks when we get to the CloudFront section, but we're just talking about the architecture of the AWS cloud itself. The edge look, there, there's typically an edge location in most major cities throughout the entire world. And the point of the edge location is when you connect to the internet, your information from the websites that you would own is cached locally, and the latency for you to get to it is reduced. There's lots of other reasons to leverage content delivery networks, which we'll talk about later. Everything from DDoS protection to server scalability. But we're talking about how the cloud is organized right now versus all the depth of how each one of these things work. We're going to be covering it for days. So fasten your seatbelts. Let's have some fun and let's learn a lot. The other point of an edge location is when we're dealing with the content delivery network, we're trying to get our data off of the public internet, which has slow and unguaranteed performance, and onto the content delivery network itself. And that's really what we're talking about. I'll give you a brief walkthrough of what it looks like. So right now, you can see here's what an edge location actually looks like. You've got your region. You've got your data centers in your region. And of course, you've got your CloudFront locations 
in every major metropolitan area. And that's going to speed up your web access. So what's it going to look like? I'll show you right now. Can't get into too much of this right now because we, we've got a lot to go through, but we will when we get into CloudFront. But here you can see an environment where you've got a user. And let's say the website that people want to go to is a website that's actually related to, I don't know, tuna.com. My cat, Cindy, she steals my iPhone. She wants to go to this tuna.com page so you can buy tuna. And let's say you can see her represented as the blue user is the upper right-hand corner. The way it works is the user wants to go to this website, which is hosted in AWS on S3 in those EC2 instances. And the user would normally go straight to AWS. Now, if I'm in Florida and I'm connected to an environment in Ohio, that could be a thousand miles away. So the way this works is the blue user up top types www.tuna.com. I just made up the website, so it could be a real URL, but don't count on that. And the user will go to the, to the, to the edge location. The edge location will look and see if it has the tuna.com page there because somebody else requested it. If it did, guess what? it will send it to right back to the user. So if it exists, when the user asks for it, the edge location will send it back. That's if in a perfect world, and that's called the cache hit. But normally what'll happen if it's the first request for the day, the user wants to go to tuna.com, they go to the edge location. The edge location will then forward it to the regional cache, which won't have it, which will then forward it automatically to the source. And now the source, We'll send it back. It'll send it to the regional cache, to the edge location, and back to the user. Now, tomorrow, or an hour later, my friend Cindy, or my cat Cindy, she has a friend named Caddy who wants to go to the tuna.com website. And she hits the edge location. The edge location says, I got it. I already gave it to Cindy the cat. And it's sent right back to her. So that's really the point of a content delivery network. We'll get to it in much, much, much greater depth when we go through CloudFront but we were covering the cloud and what it's organized, and now you know why. So region, large geographic area, availability zones, data centers, low latency environment, a data center on the way to AWS. You can think of that as a local zone. Edge locations, cloud front content delivery network. Now you go, simple, easy, effective. So the next thing we wanna get involved in is uh, we're gonna talk about the VPC. And what is the VPC, the virtual private cloud? I like to think of the VPC, and we're gonna get into much greater depth of it later, as your virtual private data center. Here's the thing. When you've got a data center, you create subnets in that data center, or VLANs, and then you create your routed interfaces and you plug your stuff in. What do you do in the AWS cloud? You carve out your virtual private data center called your VPC. You put your servers and your work and all your equipment in your VPC. So you can think of your VPC as your virtual private data center. And it's going to be a private data center on the shared AWS cloud. And it's going to be, what do you call it? That's where it's going to be housed. And here you'll put your, your servers your, and things like that. So what's this look like? You can look at a cloud and think of a cloud as basically a data center. And I have all my students in our cloud architecture career development program build a cloud from scratch to get a feel for it. But you know this is a certification and certifications are fairly high level. So you take the AWS cloud and you create your own virtual data centers inside of the AWS cloud. Now, what you might create one for you, your organization, or you might create a thousand of them for you. Why might you create a thousand? You might need to segregate your systems for security purposes. So it's common for organizations to make 10 VPCs, 20 VPCs, 100 VPCs, 1,000 VPCs. And in order to get that working, we're talking about some serious networking knowledge. But understand your VPC is just your virtual private data center. Now, Let's talk about the three main forms of a cloud architectures we're gonna talk about. The first one is a hybrid cloud, which is an organization has a data center and they have a cloud. Now, why might an organization have a data center and a cloud? 
Well, we'll draw it out, and then after this, I'll take some questions. So this is probably your best environment. An organization has their data center. They connect their data center to AWS, Azure, Google, AWS. Inside of AWS, they probably have two availability zones or two data centers. Let's copy this. We'll pop another one over here. And they have a link to them. So what you see here is, you know, great. Because the highest performance compute we can put in the data center. The data center is usually cheaper than cloud computing. Uh, the th when people told people that the cloud is cheaper, that's not true. It's almost exclusively cheaper to run things in the data center, but the cloud's so darn agile. It enables businesses to do things at a great velocity, which impacts their business performance. So the cloud is wonderful. But in this architecture, why is this so good with hybrid clouds? Well, the data center, you have a data center on a cloud. If you lose your data center, as long as your network's up, you still have your cloud, so you've got extreme availability. If the cloud provider fails, it doesn't matter, you still have your data center. So here you get the lowest pricing. In your data center, you can run higher security, you can run higher customization. And in the cloud, you can take advantage of the unlimited, near unlimited scalability and uh, the agility. So this is called a hybrid cloud architecture because it combines the best of a data center and a cloud. Now the next kind of, uh, and, and, and you can look at it another way if you want to look at it though, like in, with at an engineering diagram versus an architecture diagram. This is more of an as-built where you can see we've got our data center. We're connecting it to the cloud provider for a three-tier web app. You know, just a, you're, oops, I don't know what's going on there, but you're really just talking about a combined combination. Now, the next kind of cloud architecture, which is the least common kind, which is going to be what's recommended in the certification, is a single cloud. You pop it all on the AWS cloud, or the Azure cloud, or the Google cloud. Now, let's think about it. It's relatively easy to do so. It's highly, it, it's scalable. It makes life simple, but what happens if the cloud has a network failure? The cloud goes down and the business is done. If the cloud provider gets hacked and the cloud goes down, the business is done, all business operations cease, which is not good. And uh, there could be a control plane failure of the cloud, which will take out the whole cloud. Have we seen global cloud outages? Yes, many of them. So the key is, is a pure cloud is high risk. Now, 98% of organizations don't use a single cloud like that's taught in the certification. I'm going to say it again. 98% of organizations use more than one cloud which means when we do our AWS certification training, we're gonna tell you which stuff that you can use in a multi-cloud environment and which stuff you can't. Because if you make the wrong choices, multi-cloud will become near impossible. If you make the right choices, you will be good to go. And we will cover this. We're the only people that will ever cover this in an AWS certification. So when we get to that, listen up carefully. Now the most common environment, that, and this is what a pure cloud environment looks like. You've got your organization, you got your your, your wide area network to the cloud, it all exists on the cloud. And those, like, as long as that cloud provider doesn't go down or have a hiccup or a network problem, everything's good. But systems go down, and I recommend we plan for what happens when they go down, as opposed to just hoping they don't go down. Now, the last kind of architecture is a multi-cloud architecture. So what does this look like? Well, I'm going to draw it for you. At the end of this, we're going to do some questions and some answers, and then we'll get into the networking to get you to the cloud. So you have no network and you can't reach the cloud, you can't do anything with it anyway. So here's a traditional environment. We've got our company and they may even have their own data center, but let's just say we've got a company. And in this company, we decide to uh, deal with two clouds, which is probably the best thing to do. Let's say we have AWS over here. Let's say we have Azure over here. We take, uh, two data centers in each cloud. So we can say this is AZ1. We can call this AZ2. We'll do the same thing in Azure. All clouds are pretty much the same. They're just somebody else's network in a data center. The only thing that changes is the name. And now we'll have networking connections to both cloud providers. And by doing so, 
we can leverage the best services that each cloud provider has. For example, Azure has the best artificial intelligence right now by many experts. AWS is some of the biggest infrastructure in the world, so we can combine them. Or we could set them up in a high availability environment where if AWS goes down, doesn't matter. If Azure goes down, doesn't matter because we still have another cloud. And that's why 98% of organizations do not put all their eggs in one basket or a single cloud. So, Chris, I've got 10 minutes for questions. If you, one of you guys wants to bring in the questions for me over to StreamYard, I'll answer questions. And remember, please sign up for tonight. We're going to go on Zoom. You can come off mute, and we can answer any questions that you actually have. But in the meantime, let's get to some questions now. Are edge locations only important when using CloudFront? Emmanuel, edge locations are purely for CloudFront. There is absolutely nothing else. Which means if you set up your environment with a multi-content delivery network environment, and you were to use, say, Akamai or Fastly, guess what? You wouldn't be using edge locations. You'd be using their equivalent of an edge location. And mind you, most people use multiple content delivery networks, including Amazon. They use several for themselves. How long will data stay in the edge location until the cache times out? Now, Cedric, great question. Anytime we have a cache, we have to determine how long we want the information to stay in the cache. And we can set that. The longer we set it up, the more scalable the environment is. The shorter we set it up, Guess what the problem is? The, sh it's, it, it, the shorter we set it up, it'll be more the work, but the more frequently new pages get seen. So we'll talk much more about that when we get into content delivery networks. Is the CDN an edge location? No. The content delivery network is housed in, it, it, the servers are in the edge location. The edge location is, is a data center, and that's all it is with the name edge location. A content delivery network, there are tons of them that are out there, and they all have different names, and they don't use terms like edge location. Most of this stuff is just somebody's branding name. Edge location is somebody think a marketing person made. How do you know if a link in the edge is invalid or stale? Well, if it's a link, what's going to happen is the links are going to have layer two signaling between them. And if the layer two signaling goes down, the link will go down and you won't have it. So that's just standard basic networking, Kingsley. Uh, all devices have a layer one and a layer two, and we'll get into these states later. And the routing or some switches that know how to do this instantly go down when a link is down. What are the architecture names? I'm not going to say, hey, hon, I don't care about you learning the architecture names. I care about you learning the concept. The concept is you can stick all your eggs in one basket. That's called a pure cloud architecture. Would you put all your, all your money in a single stock? I wouldn't. Would you put everything that you owned if you were in the wilderness in a single basket and let the wolves eat it? I wouldn't. So that's a pure cloud environment. A hybrid cloud environment is you've got your data center and you've got your cloud and you leverage the best of both. And a multi-cloud environment is you connect multiple clouds together. Chris, in a multi-cloud architecture, is there a primary deployment and then the other CSPs are staged on both sides? Any way you want it. Any way you want it. You can put them 50-50. You can put them, it's based on your goals. What if the edge location has a stale or invalid link? Kings, let's, let's separate them. If you've got a bad link, the edge location will go down. There's nothing to it. Don't worry about it. Now, if it has stale information in the cache, you need to be clear. You uh, obviously, when you subscribe to any service, you turn it on and it becomes there. So it's just a matter of enabling CloudFront. That's how you sign up for edge locations. This is Chris, your producer. I am going to suggest that this next question, uh, they we invite them to the extra hour session, but I'll leave that up to you. Augustine, you mentioned the data center is much cheaper than the cloud. Please show some more light. Okay, the cloud provider is renting you their data center which means they have to buy the data center, 
They have to operate the data center. They have to hire sales reps they have to, to sell the data center, marketing people to do the data center, spend a ton of money on branding. Then they got to charge more than all of that to generate a profit. I'll give you an example, Augustine. We run a 10 server cloud computing environment. It was $11,000 on the public cloud. We bought the servers all for $10,000. That's the kind of thing we can typically discuss, the cloud finance and cloud economics. But understand this, the cloud model is a landlord tenant model. If a landlord pays $2,000 of mortgage payments for the property they're renting you, they have to allocate for vacancy charges, they have to allocate repairs, they have to allocate for real estate commissions, they have to allocate for business licenses, and then they gotta raise the price even more. They have to pay their real estate taxes, they've gotta pay for repairs, and then they gotta raise the prices even more. That's cloud computing, and that's why the cloud is almost always more expensive. What's the difference between an edge location and a local zone? Edge location is where the content delivery network is. The local zone is a data center where you put your stuff. What is the difference between an edge location and an edge location? Edge computing is when you put your stuff at the network edge, like a local zone. An edge location is where you actually deal with the content delivery network. Sana Healing UK, if AWS didn't make up the ridiculous name Edge Location and they called it the Content Delivery Network Location, it would be very clear to you, but they made up the term Edge Location because it sounds great. Unfortunately, it doesn't explain anything. Is a VPC a combination of a public and private cloud? It is absolutely not. You can create a VPC in your private cloud. A VPC is just a virtual private data center. So. Think of a data center as a giant building filled with servers. Allocate 3% of it to you. That's your virtual private cloud. Does CloudFront perform like a cache in respects to latency performance? That is all cloud. Well, CloudFront responds as a cache, but also a network. And the network is equally important. Equally important. So the answer is, uh, Yes, but it does more than that, and we'll get into it in depth. Is there any kind of redundancy? Saeed, there's redundancy everywhere, but the problem is there's so many things that can go wrong in a cloud provider. So when we design wide area networks for businesses, we would never get two links on AT&T. We would get one on AT&T and one on Verizon or one on Vodafone and one on Orange, or one on a Titsalot and one on somebody else. And the reason we do that is if a service provider has an outage, even though it's a different link, that could go down too. So the point is there is redundancy, but the cloud providers share a common control plane and a common network, which means if something happens to the control plane, the whole cloud goes down. If something happens in a hacking attack and the whole cloud is DDoS, the whole cloud goes down. If the network gets, has a problem, it doesn't matter how many regions and availability zones, it can, it can go the entire way and it can still take the entire cloud. Giovanni, you passed the SAAC 03 on October, 30 October, wonderful. We helped you a lot, that's even better. The exam was hard, but you were focused and passed. Absolutely wonderful. Congratulations, Giovanni, and I'm so thrilled we were able to help. Can there be more than one local zone? You can always have more than one lo local edge location, but typically speaking, you better it would be better to do it with multiple clouds. That's how I would do multiple local zones. So while we're here, give me a hashtag, AWS Solution Architect Associate, and then we'll get back to the content. And we can get into much more depth of these answers tonight. While you're at it, please like the content if you're having a good time and learning something. Please subscribe and hit the bell to be notified. Okay, well, if all of our stuff is on the cloud now, right? We, uh, we, we have to be able to reach it. And we want to be able to reach it in a secure manner. So let's talk about how we can reach our systems on the cloud, how we can manage our systems on the cloud. We don't need a bashing hose. We've got a wire or some connection to the cloud, and that's how we can manage things and do things in the most secure environment. So if our stuff's on the cloud, we have to have a network connection to it. 
That's how we reach it. Otherwise, I want you to think about this. Let's say you've got a beautiful castle in the middle of the ocean, but you don't have a boat. You can't get home to your castle. That's no good. So we need a connection to the cloud to be able to use our systems. Now, there's a couple of options. We're going to discuss the two most common options. The first one is through a virtual private network. Now, a virtual private network is a means to create a private secure network over a public network. Now, there are a lot of kinds of VPNs that have been created in the last 30 years that I've been a network architect. Frame Relay was a VPN. ATM was a VPN type of technology. But L2TP tunnels are a VPN. MPLS BGP VPNs are a VPN. But we're going to be talking about an IPsec VPN because that's typically what we're going to use to connect to the cloud. And here's what why we're going to do this. Two things would occur. If I just wanted to connect you remotely through the internet, we'd have a problem. It's not secure. Anybody in the entire internet with a protocol analyzer that could get into one of those switches or a sniffer could see everything I sent to you, and that might not be a good thing. The other reason we use a VPN is we have public and private addresses. RFC 1918, which is from the Internet Engineering Task Force, specified that we must use private IP addresses internally or for anything that doesn't need to be reachable on the internet because we have a shortage of IP addresses. So inside of our systems, we use private addresses and things that need to be reachable on the internet need public addresses. Now, if we're going to connect across the internet, we can't push private addresses across the internet unless we create a tunnel across the internet. And that's another reason we're gonna create a virtual private network. So I can push private addresses through the internet inside of this tunnel. And the other reason is internet routing architectures are, believe me, highly complex. If we wanted a traffic engineer through the internet, you know, the Cisco certified internet expert, which is 75,000 pages of reading, still doesn't give you enough knowledge on how to do that. I can tell you, my CCIE, which is number 747, was my intro to networking. And it took me 25 years after that to learn how to really do this. So. You know, by using a VPN, you connect to the internet, you connect to the internet, you tunnel through it, and it makes the routing easier. And we can pass our OSPF or our BGP information directly through this tunnel, so we can route through this tunnel. Now, it's really going to look something like this. And this is the way AWS would make it look to you. If this is helpful, this is fine. Basically, they've got a virtual gateway. You've got a data center. If you think that's helpful for you, great. Here's the way I would I would actually show it to you. Uh, I want you to understand both sides. I would set up a data center over here. I'd create another data center over here. And basically, you can you can consider your internet to be. Let me just draw this box over here. Your internet is over here. The organizations will have a router that connects them to the internet on both sides. Hey, Mike, please share your screen. Thanks, Chris. So in this environment, uh, you can see I've got two data centers. Those little circles recommend look like routers. Over here, we have the internet. And basically, what we're doing is we're going to connect this to the internet. We're going to connect the other side to the internet. And then we're going to create a tunnel between these two routers through the internet. And that tunnel that we're creating over here, that's the VPN. That tunnel is going through the internet, and it's really going like that through there. But it's going to look like it's configured between the routers, and it will be configured from router to router, our IPsec tunnel. And that's how we're pushing the information over the internet in a secure environment. Now, because we're using IPsec, we get a few things along the way in addition to security and private addresses. Any information we put inside the internet is encrypted, which means if you don't have the secret decryption key, none of the information is usable. So we're connecting to each other across the public internet in a secure and private manner. First big benefit of IPsec. Now, the second side of IPsec is very important. It's called peer identification. 
you know, that voice in the background, that's Christopher Johnson. He's my chief operating officer. If I want to create a connection for, for me, between me and Christopher Johnson, I want to know it's Christopher Johnson on the other end, not somebody pretending to be Christopher Johnson to hear the inner workings of my company. So guess what? I have to know that Chris is Chris. So I might, I might normally do a video call and I'm going to look at him. I might also, in a secure environment, ask him a, a, a question. Chris, what is uh, the password of the day? And, and that's how people would identify and authenticate each other. So IPsec encrypts the traffic, and IPsec makes it that you can identify who's on the other end so you don't get what we have in security called the man-in-the-middle attack. The next thing that IPsec provides is message integrity. Every message is given a hash. And if you're unfamiliar with hashes, look up one-way hashes. It's something you should know. Can't cover it here, but look up uh, one-way hashes. And basically, it makes sure that the message hasn't been changed. If I said to you, Cindy is a cat, but what you heard is parrot is Cindy, that would be a problem along the way. But I want you to think about it. In the financial environment, someone wants to process a trade for 10,000 shares of Apple and somebody makes it 100,000 shares of Apple. Well, that's gonna cause a financial problem. Let's say a doctor wanted to prescribe two milligrams of a medication and somebody changed it to 200 milligrams. Somebody could die. So IPsec provides message integrity. It makes sure the message has not been altered. And IPsec also has sequence numbers on the messages. And we get something called non-repudiation, which means if I say to you that multi-cloud architectures are common, a week from now, I can say that on this day and this date, I didn't tell you that multi-architecture, multi-cloud architectures are the most common. Poof, good, done, simple. Uh, IPsec, tunneling private information through a public network, like the internet, know who your users are on both sides. We've got uh, message integrity checking, non-repudiation, and security. So now you know what we're really talking about. <laughs> So why would people use VPNs? Well, they are fast to set up. Everybody has internet access pretty much everywhere in the world. Go to my home in Greece, we've got internet access. Doesn't matter where you go, there's internet access. So it's already there. So for me to create a tunnel to a tunnel, I can do it in minutes. I've got thousands of students that we train to be cloud architects and they VPN directly in our data center. They're in South Africa, they're in Cameroon. They're in Nigeria, they're in Spain, they're in England, they're in Australia, they're in New Zealand, they're in Hong Kong, they're in the Philippines, it doesn't matter. They're in the US, they all get in via the internet. Simple to create and deploy in minutes. But VPNs have their disadvantages too. First, if you put your traffic on the internet, there's no guarantees. You may have a 100 gig connection to the internet or a 10 gig connection, but does that mean you can use it? No. The internet has to have the available bandwidth. Let's say you buy a Ferrari and you're on a highway. Can you drive that Ferrari at 200 miles an hour? Probably not, because there might be cars or traffic or police on the highway that won't let you do it. Well, on the internet, it's the same thing. So internet bandwidth is not guaranteed. It's cheap, but you don't know if your data is gonna get through. So if it's critical, you can never use a VPN. You must use a private line. If it's okay for you to lose some data, VPNs are good, they're cheap, and they're available. Internet latency. I don't know if it's going to take you 20 router hops and go halfway around the world to reach me because I don't know because it's the internet and the internet routing changes constantly. So once you get your data to the internet, it is best effort. So that's the disadvantage of a VPN. Now let's talk a little bit about AWS VPNs because if you don't understand the technology, it doesn't matter any of the things that AWS does, which is why we're focusing on the tech and how it works. With AWS, a VPN is typically set up between an organization's data center and their AWS VPC. It's called a site-to-site -site VPN. We could also create a multi-site VPN. That might be a data center to two VPCs, for example. No big deal, or to two offices, or anything like that. And the way it works is you have to set up both sites You've got a router on yeah, your end. You've got the AWS gateway, which functions as a virtual router uh, on their end. And those endpoints encapsulate the packets in IPsec and send them into the tunnel. Now, 
When you set up the tunnel, we've got to establish the security measures. So when you deal with IPsec, there's an internet key exchange where you exchange the security keys. Now, when this encryption key, when this, uh, what do you call it, internet key exchange uh, security association occurs, we get to specify the encryption type, the encryption algorithm. <coughs> now, if we want to set up dynamic routing, guess what? We can still do that with BGP. And uh, keep that in mind. Now, AWS will tell you that their VPNs are highly available. There's a major flaw with this, and I'll show you the architecture. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell it to you the way they tell it to you first because they make the exam and then I want you to know better. You create your VPN and you connect it to a virtual, to a VPN gateway at AWS. And when you connect to them, they automatically create you a virtual link or vir to two different availability zones, which means if you're linked to AWS and one of their availability zones goes down, you're still connected to another availability zones. Now you can make them active active where you're connected to both at the same time. You can make it AL availability zone first and then ship over to availability zone two if it doesn't work. Now, if you have people that don't understand networking, do active passive. Because to set up active active or to load share across links, you need to have somebody that understands networking. And we're not talking intro to network working like the AWS advanced networking certification. We're talking networking networking like network architects, people that would come from Cisco and that sort of background. So I'm gonna show you why they show you it's high availability and then I'm gonna show you why it's not. So in this environment, we have our data center on the right side of the screen. We've created a VPN tunnel and you can see it's connecting us to availability zone one and two. I hope everybody sees that. Now, here's the thing to remember. Now, these little, the thing, the, the, the router with the lock in the in AWS where it says endpoint one, that is a high availability device. It is not a physical router. It will not go down. So AWS is right when they call it high availability, but here's the problem. See this router over here that I just drew a line through? If that router dies, you've got nothing, nothing, which means it doesn't matter how redundant they are on the AWS side if you have no redundancy on your own. So keep that in the back of your mind. You know, I had a physics professor many years ago and she used to tell me education is an ever decreasing number of lies. She was right. When you know more, you understand. So the only way you can create a true high availability environment is let's say this is our data center over here. And let's say this is the AWS cloud over here. Is you connect, oops is what you're gonna do is you're gonna to connect to two virtual routers with them, not a single virtual router. And you're also gonna use two routers on your end. And by doing so, by creating connections between them, if your router dies, it doesn't matter. Be or, or your internet connection, you should use two separate internet connections. And by using two separate internet connections and having two sets of routers, you're gonna be in good shape because this way you can lose your router. You can have a power outage in your router. The router could crash, get corrupted, and you've got a backup. And that's why this is the only way that we can ever make this work in a true high availability environment. So yes, their stuff is highly available, but it doesn't matter if your stuff is that doesn't connect them. So, you know, when it comes to high availability, there's an expression the military uses. Two is one, I'm sorry, two is, yeah, two is one, one is none, and three is better than two. So keep that in the back of your mind. So how would you set up a VPN? Well, all you have to really do is get the AWS documentation and it'll tell you to click, click, click four buttons or so, and it's done, it's nothing. But I need you to understand what goes on. First thing you need to do is you need to determine which gateway on the AWS end you wanna to connect to. Then you have to determine how you're gonna do your routing like you would in any network. Static routing or dynamic routing. Now, in your internal network, you could use things like EIGRP, OSPF, intermediate systems, intermediate systems internally, but with the cloud provider, it's somebody else's network. So you're gonna connect to them via BGP because they are external to you. So we'll determine it. We'll set up our pick a routing method. We'll configure the tunnels and poof, we're done. Very simple. Now with our VPN setup, we have a couple options. 
We've got custom options, and this gives you the flexibility, but you need to know something about routing. Look, if you don't know routing, don't be involved in this anyway, or go find yourself a good network engineer. But if you do the, uh, the if you set it up, the virtual gateway on the RN will be automatically configured based on the parameters you suggest. The AWS management console you can use to easily auto create your VPN. And it'll even spit out the configuration for your router. But if you don't know networking, please don't do this because you're going to create outages later. Please find a qualified network engineer. And you can monitor the status of your tunnels by using CloudWatch. Keep that in your mind. Now, remember, internet bandwidth, not guaranteed, not even 1%. Any hiccups on the internet, you got a problem. So the next way that you could connect to the cloud provider and we're going to cover the two that are in this exam, is with a private line. Private line, 50-plus year old technology, you basically buy a wire between two locations. Just a simple wire. That's the way I like to think of a private line. I like to view it as a wire between you and them. Here's a handy-dandy uh, uh, Apple, Apple wire, but it's just a wire. Here you go. Here's your private line. You get a wire to them. Now, it's not exactly a wire. There's a couple of things that are going back here, but... Let's talk about what they are. When you get a wire, you guaranteed to get all the bandwidth you paid for. The only people that are using it is you. Now, your private wire is more secure than the public internet. And of course, you can run IPsec over your private wire. Now, we've been doing it since 1998. People like me that have been in networking, AWS allowed that next year. So you can get the encryption, the security, all those benefits of IPsec and still run it over your private line. Private line, guaranteed bandwidth, guaranteed minimum latency, highest reliability. And you can bundle them together too. It's called the link aggregation group. So you can have one wire, bundle it together, two wires looking like one wire, put another wire. Now it still looks like one wire, just a big fat wire versus three little skinny wires. And we can do so to increase our bandwidth. It's called the link aggregation group. You may have heard things like port channel or ether channel. There were other proprietary versions that were used to this many years ago, but it's just bundling links together for maximum bandwidth. Now, when you get your links, you can get a one gig link, a 10 gig link, or now a 100 gig link. Keep that in the back of your mind. And they are either in one gig or 10 gig modules. And, you know, I'm going to show you what it looks like you know, the way AWS would show you, and then we're gonna, we're gonna get into more deep uh, drawings themselves. But, you know, here's the way AWS would show you. You've got your organization, you get your wire, and that connects you to them. We're gonna get into more detail on that in a minute, but really that's what you're gonna, what you're gonna be dealing with. So what makes this stuff work under the hood? Well, basically you've got your switches and routers on both sides of the equation, you got your laser optics, which sit in the switches and routers on both sides. They're just lasers. And then you got your piece of fiber optic cable. Now, what kind of cable are we dealing with? Well, we're dealing with long distance, so we're dealing with single mode fiber. And this is a test question. You might see it on this side. Remember it. You will be either using 1000 base dash LX or 10 G base dash LR. That's it. So 1000 base dash LX or 10 G base dash LR, standard networking interfaces. Now, if you've ever worked with a fiber optic connection before, you understand it's basically a cable with a piece of glass in between it. And you've got two lasers. You've got a send laser and you've got a receive laser. Send laser, receive laser. Now, it's possible that the send laser works and the receive laser does not. Now that is problematic because you think the link is there. You send your data, but it can't come back. You can't respond. You can't do any kind of TCP handshakes and then everything falls apart. So the good news is in the networking world about 20 years ago, we came up with something called bilateral forwarding detection. And that means it will monitor the status of both lasers, the send and the receive. And if either laser goes down, It'll chop off the link, and that way you can send it to another link that you have. Now, we're also going to be dealing with 802.1Q tagging and trunking in order to get to AWS, simple basic networking. If you don't understand that, the good news is we have a free CCNA boot camp on our YouTube channel, and we'll get down and dirty in that. 
But the reality is you're not exactly purchasing a direct connection with the cloud. What you're really doing is you're purchasing a direct, a, a wire to a direct connection location, which the rest of us internet people call a point of presence. And then we're creating a wire between them. So let me walk you through this, because this is really what we're dealing with. As you can see on the extreme right over here, we have our data center. And what you can see is in our data center, what we have is we've got a wide area connection to two direct connection locations. Why? Because a single link is a single point of failure. So we got two of them. And you can see what we do is we buy a wide area connection where it says from router to the router at the direct connection location. And so we buy a connection from us, to the, which is a blue router, to the blue routers that are actually there inside of the direct connection locations. Now then, AWS has their router there. And it says DX router on it. That is the AWS router. So the next thing that you can see on this diagram is a yellow cable between the, bl between the blue routers and the orange DX routers. What that is, is that their, their switch versus our switch slash router. And we have to run a cable between our switch and their switch. That's called a cross connect. And once we get on the AWS network, we get layer two backhauled all the way to the AWS backbone, which is a simple thing. So realistically, maybe, maybe that didn't do a great job explaining it. Maybe I'll draw it out for you to make it simple. Here's the way it works. What we do is we come from our building over here. Here's our, here's our build, here's us. We've got a router over here, which connects us to the direct connection location. Then we have this direct connection location. Uh, I'm also gonna call it a point of presence because that way other internet service provide, other internet people will understand it. We're gonna, cause that's really all it is. We're gonna get, we're gonna buy a wide area link, one gig, 10 gig, 100 gigs or to, to here. And this is gonna be us, this is gonna be our router. And then what we need to do is over here, we're gonna actually, I'm gonna pop it over here so you can see it. Let's call this the AWS switch. And then this is gonna bring you, this is gonna bring it back to the AWS network. So what'll happen is these people will already have their layer two links back from the point of presence location directly to AWS. Oops. We've got our devices. I'm not sure what's going on here. Oh, Sorry, my mouse froze. So we've got our router connecting to our router and you can see the AWS switch connects back to AWS. So we're going to just need to get a little, you know, to get a connection between these two. That link that we're gonna get over here, which we're gonna, is gonna be what's called a cross connect. And that's gonna take us from us to the AWS switch. I'll call it a cross connect. Well, I'm just gonna call it a cross connect. CC, it won't fit in there. So now you know how that works. That is the underlying way that all of these uh, private letters occur. So let's talk about the next part of making this work. You know, you can buy a wide area connection to you, no big deal. AWS can buy a wide area connection to AWS. But should AWS just let you plug into their network? Here, let me plug in and hack you. So the answer is of course not. And because AWS can't just let us plug in, we have to request the ability, can I connect to you? So we call, we, we reach out to AWS and we need to get something called a letter of authorization that enables us to run that cross connect. So to use a direct connection, we need a letter of authorization. The process to receive a letter of authorization is pretty simple. We request one, either via the management console, one of the APIs to the cloud or the command line interface. When our application is complete, AWS will provision the switch port on their switch in the direct connection. And they will say, here's a document that you can now use to connect it. Your internet service provider or whoever your service provider is, your wider network provider has, connect, has permission to connect your device to their device and then they plug in the wire. Now, anytime we're dealing with any of these kind of direct connections or connectivities, we've got two sets of things we can connect to in AWS. 
public and private virtual interfaces. Let's talk about the difference. We're going to start with public interfaces. There are certain things that are not in your VPC. They are shared stuff. S3, which is object storage. DynamoDB, which is a proprietary database that is going to get you in trouble in multi-cloud, but it's in a public area. Things like SQS and public endpoints. They are there, and they're public. So that's why it's called the public virtual interface. Your private line can take you and create a virtual connection for you to connect to public stuff. And when you connect to public things, you need a public IP address on both sides of your router. And of course, you know, you can exchange routing information via BGP to know how to find all the routes to all your good stuff. So pretty simple. AWS is a very basic BGP implementation. Think routing 20 plus years ago, very limited number of routes that you can send, very minimal BGP features and functionalities. It's the bare minimum to connect you to the cloud. So you're gonna have to be really strong at networking to make sure your IP addresses are well planned. You've done some route summarization, et cetera, et cetera, to make it work. Now we've got our private interfaces, so let's talk about them. Our private interfaces on these links get us to the private stuff, the things inside of our virtual private data center or virtual private cloud. And we can use a private IP address, and we should use a private IP address on both sides to connect us to the cloud. Now, with private interfaces, we can advertise 100 routes. So I mean it. You guys got to be really good in your route summarization and IP addressing. If you're not a CCIE level network architect, go find somebody. Go find somebody. I'm used to routers that have 800,000 routes in them, and now you can only send them 100. Now, is it because AWS isn't smart? No. It's because AWS may have 10 million customers each sending them 100 routes. So you can imagine the routing that they have to deal with and the complexity of it. So that's why you need good IP addressing so you can have a good route summarization plan so you can get away with 100 routes. Let's talk about the concept of a link aggregation group. AWS will enable you to bundle up to four links together. Well, just think about it. You got a one gig link. What if you need two? You bundle two of them together. What if you need three? You bundle three of them together. What if you need four gigs? You bundle four of them together. Now, if you need about four gigs, you might as well be in the 10 gig link. And you may also find that it's cheaper to get a 10 gig link than two single one gig links too. But when you're dealing with a link aggregation group, it means same type of link, same speed, same latency, which means if you've got four links on AT&T, you probably need four links backed up on a Verizon because these links, when they get so similar, they're not going to have a lot of redundancy in them. So keep that in the back of your mind. And here's the good news with the link aggregation group. I've got four 10 gig links here, right? One of the 10 gig links goes down. I still have three 10 gig links. I'm, I'm pretty happy. I've got 30 gigs. But what if I have four 10 gig links as a primary and four 10 gig links as a backup? And one of my 10 gig links in the primary goes down. So I've got 30 gigs here or the backup has 40. Well, we can, we can basically take the entire link aggregation group down and therefore switch over to the primary, which has more bandwidth. Keep that in the back of your mind. And those are some of the cool things we can do. What is a link aggregation link? Just bundled links. That's all we're really talking about. So Chris, I think we're gonna, the next topic is gonna be storage. But before we get to storage, I think we should actually get to uh, some questions. So anybody have some questions on the connections to the cloud? It looks like Mark Malukovich has been answering some. He's a CCIE, he's a world-class network engineer. So highly recommended answers, they're probably great. Ayuba, hi sir, my name is Ayuba from Morocco and I wanna get a really good understanding of cloud technology. Thanks so much for this resource. You are so welcome, that's why we're here. We try to make this information available to anyone in the world. I know to find access to a class where you can ask questions is typically several thousand dollars. I know that is beyond the budget of so many wonderful people in the entire world. I also know that 99% of the content out there is by someone that never worked in this field before. They took a cert and they're teaching it and I, you all deserve better and that's why we're here. Would AWS implement default encryption for storage moving forward? I believe they've actually set that up. Everybody else has been doing it 
for many, many years. But we're talking storage, not necessarily wide area networks. There's times and a place to turn on encryption and times and places not to, and it's the wisdom to know when. Is there a press practice for the standard encryption used, Blowfish via triple does? Matthew, I wanna give you the architect's perspective. There's no such thing as the best technology. There's the, the best technology and the best encryption is the one that works best for your customer. The more encryption we add, the more overhead we add to the systems. So what are we protecting? How sensitive is the material we're protecting? What's the likelihood of the information being hacked? What happens when the information is being hacked? So we always have to analyze the needs of the business long, 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 long before we would ever even think about the technology or encryption standard. But good question. Arthur, does the IPsec VPN perfection work with a man in the mill attack if the attack is using a cell on wheels? I don't know what you mean by a cell on wheels, but the end-to-end -end endpoint verification is incredibly strong of IPsec. Are routers required to connect to data centers? A, Hunt, you can't connect to anything in the entire world without a router, with the exception as if they're on your own VLAN and then you can connect with the switch. We should be thankful that routers are required to connect to everything. And that enables us to micro-segment our environments into VLANs or multiple VPCs and then route between them. So it gives us a lot of security. Emmanuel, is BGP always required when using VPNs? No, BGP is required with a direct connection, but not a VPN. So I want you to think about how many connections. Here's static routing, which is if you don't use BGP. Let's say you've got 10,000 routers out there and something happens on one router, you're gonna to have to go to 9,999 routers and manually enter your routes. By, and if something breaks, the traffic's not gonna know how to go around there unless somebody was smart enough to set up recursive static routes and that's gonna get even com more complicated. So keep it in the back of your mind. If you don't use BGP, it's gonna be manually laborious and labor intensive to pop all these routes in the routing table. So I would use BGP, but I built a career on BGP, so, you know. Connecting to the data center only for hybrid architectures? No. I want you to think about it this way. You've got a data center. You've got all your sensitive applications on the cloud and you need good access to them. You still need to connect to it. How, the, how else are you gonna reach it? You're gonna go through the internet? Does a business want their secure information over the internet? No. Is the internet guaranteed? No. So if we don't set up a direct connection, and let's say I've got a bank with 20,000 employees there and everything's in the cloud and we don't have a network to it, we can't reach any of it. So we will always need a connection to the cloud. And that's why, you know, when people were using Bastion hosts for connectivity, I'm like, why would you waste your time and open up all these security violations? You already got a wire directly to them, whether it be a virtual wire or a physical wire. So you're always gonna need to connect to the cloud if you wanna be able to reach those systems privately. Edge, uh, Wachima, edge locations do not run on Route 53. Route 53 is AWS branded DNS, which you may or may not be able to use in a multi-cloud environment. We'll talk about that later. And the strengths and weaknesses of the architectural posts of doing so. But edge locations are there. Now, you have to get a DNS location or address of the edge location, and you can use any form of DNS for there, but no, they're completely different unrelated technologies. But we will get to DNS. The connections I taught you are connecting from AWS to data center. They're the same connections if you wanted to connect to Azure or Google or Alibaba or anybody else's cloud anywhere in the world. They're the same connections we've been using for the last 25 years in networking for all environments. None of this AWS stuff is new. It's all the same stuff. It's at the network in a data center. They just virtualized it and charge you rental rates as opposed to purchase rates. Said, you said, what about IPv6? What about IPv6? Nothing changes. It's just the address changes. All the same. OSPF now supports IPv6. BGP supports IPv6. All the same. Where does the edge location come in? The IP, uh, IPsec between the customer data center and the uh, AWS? Uh, it doesn't. Ali Khan, the edge location is just simply a point of presence for web users that are remote users. 
not for you to connect to the location. They are totally unrelated. Remember, region, large geographic area, availability zone, data center, local zone, a data center that's close to you, edge location only for external web users, no other points. And there's lots more than just web stuff. Mike, okay, is IPsec used for direct connection encryption? It could be. It's not on by default, but you could turn it on if you desire. <laughs> What's a VLAN compared to a VPC? You take a switch you, and you chop it into four logical switches, you've created four VLANs. You take a data center and you chop it up into logical data centers and you've got VPCs. Similar but different. I want to get to 615 Wani's connection. You asked what's the career path to being a solution architect. You train to be a solution architect. It's your first job. Now, download the how to become, get your first cloud architect job, and you will see. But I've got people at AWS, at Azure, at Deloitte, Accenture, KPMG, and I got to tell you, all of them hire people with no experience if they are competent and capable. I can give you hundreds of examples. I can go on and on and on about, but that is your first job. And you don't learn how to fly an airplane by being a flight attendant. You don't learn how to be a doctor by working as a nurse. And the career path to become a solution architect is you train to become a solution architect. You get the right skills, and that's the job you go after. So go download that free guide, and you should be good to go. And also tonight, we're going to be on Zoom for an hour. I want to make sure we clarify these things for you. Please sign up the link. Pop the link to that in the chat box to, to below. But please do get the how to get your first cloud architect job webinar link too. I mean, certification is, all, is very minimal to do with what we actually do as architects. And I want you to get hired and it's the best job ever. So please download the get your free architect job guide. So now let's talk about storage on the AWS cloud. So what is storage? Actually, before I get into storage, I want to make sure you're not sleeping on me. You know, it's a lot of effort to do this, and I want to know you're awake, you are alert, and you are oriented. So give me a hashtag, AWS Solutions Architect Associate. And that way, I know you're here. When I see a bunch of them flooding through the screen, I'll get back to the content. I like to know people are awake. Good, it looks like some of you guys are out there and you're paying attention, good. I wanna make sure everybody learns. I have fun with this. Love teaching, I love when that light bulb goes off for people. Okay, so storage options on the cloud. I'm gonna begin with, what is storage? Well, it's really a place to put your stuff. What kind of stuff? In organizations, data for example. Now, when it comes to storage, you know, there's two kinds of storage we can talk about. We can talk about volatile storage or ephemeral storage, and we can talk about non-volatile storage. So both of them are critical components to your environment, but I want you to understand the difference. Ephemeral or volatile storage goes away. So let's say we put stuff in ephemeral storage or volatile storage, and then we terminated the instance that we had, or we terminated the virtual machine. Everything we've stored for the last 10 years is gone. I don't think that's a good option, right? So by comparison, non-volatile storage is stuff that survives a reboot, because RAM is the volatile storage, doesn't survive a reboot. Or the instance storage, the storage inside of the systems themselves does not survive an instance termination. You kill it, it's gone. So non-volatile storage is typically like your hard drive, okay? And I want you to think about that. And we're gonna be talking about types of non-volatile storage. Quite frankly, when we get into the storage, we're also going to get rid of all the lies that the cloud providers talk about. 
and we're going to give you the information straight so you can understand how to architect it. We're going to talk about block storage, object storage, and file storage. I'm probably going to talk about the technologies first a little bit, and then we'll get into the AWS pieces. In the cloud computing environment, we use block storage uh, uh, to function as a virtual hard drive for our systems. Block storage is a type of storage area in network, meaning it's accessed over a network. When I started, it was accessed over separate fiber channel networks. These fiber channel networks were separate networks. The servers had a card they'd plug into the fiber channel. Now it's typically done via internet protocol, but both work. The key with block storage is you take your data and you break it down into blocks. Now, you take your data, you pop it into a block, and you give the block an identifier. Now, here's why we use so much block storage. The blocks of data can be stored anywhere on the network. So, got a server over here. I can store my blocks in 500 different hard drives that are stuck on the network in the block storage environment. And by doing so, I'm separating my servers and my storage. I'm decoupling, and when you can decouple, you can add scalability in many cases. And this is why block storage is there. So think about it from Azure's perspective or AWS's perspective or Google's perspective. If they only had the storage in the servers, they'd run out. But here, they can build an entire data center full of storage stuff. They could have buildings that are football fields long, that are from rack to the ceilings with storage. And as long as they've got a network connection to the rest of the stuff, all those servers can store it there. So that's why cloud providers use block storage. It scales, and it's almost an unlimited capacity. Now, the next type of storage we're going to talk about is object storage. Now, object storage is kind of weird. You take your data, you break it down into objects, OK? And each object gets an object identifier. So the way object storage works is it's typically flat storage. It's almost like a database where you take a piece of data, it gets broken down into an object. There's a piece of metadata that actually describes the data, which makes it really exciting. And there's a pointer to it. So I add some data, there's a pointer to it. Alonzo from my team adds the data, there's a pointer to it. Chris adds it, there's a pointer to it. Mark Malonovich, a super network architect that hopefully joins my company one day, poof, there's a pointer to it. And that way, you know, it's just like accessing a database. We can stick in this giant flat environment and we point to it and we can find it when we need it. So these are typically this key with object storage. Now, object storage, we have to understand, is not normal. Every time we modify it, we create a new version by default. Now, the cloud providers have disabled that, but we create a new version by default. So they get full really fast. Now, systems themselves do not mount object storage. You're not going to connect your server to object storage. Keep that in the back of your mind. And Here's what it's going to look like. Our data is going to be broken down in these objects. There's going to be some descriptive data about those objects, which is called metadata. And you can see all the objects are just stored in this environment. And there'll be a pointer to locate on how to find them. That's really what we're talking about with regards to object storage. Now, the last kind of storage that we have is file storage. And file storage is just like traditional storage. It's just like your hard drive. It uses standard file systems like NTFS. And they can be mounted across the, uh, locally or on the network. So those are your three types. You can typically think of file storage as hierarchical. You create a file root. Then you've got a home directory. Inside your home directory, you may have a download or a movies or a pictures. That is file storage. So the first kind of storage we're going to talk about is Amazon's branded object storage. And they call it Amazon Simple Storage Solution S3. Who makes up these names? I have no idea, 
But I promise you, if you're talking to a client and you use a term like AWS S3, they may escort you out of the room. But if you tell them about their object storage, they're going to understand because that is you've got that is the terminology they understand. So what is S3? It's object storage, and it's integrated into so many AWS services. And no matter who's cloud provider, you're going to be dealing with a lot of object storage. Amazon S3 is relatively high availability. They call high availability 99.99% available. That means if you need your data for about five and a half hours each year, you won't be able to get it. But that's their definition of high availability, 99.99% available. That may be enough. It may not be enough for a business based upon the use case. It's also durability. And what does durability mean? It means that even if you can't access it now, the chances of it being lost are, 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 almost, are almost slim to none. Now, I still recommend a backup solution, but how durable is the data? 99.99999% all the way to not nine decimal points of 99. So 99.9999 carried out for nine for nine nines after the 99%. So it's pretty durable. The chances of losing it are very small. And of course, there's notifications via event bridge. So when would you use object storage or Amazon AWS S3? Well, backup and archival of an organization's data. You might put your static website hosting, like if I had photos of my cat Cindy. And I take a lot of photos of my cat, Cindy. I could create a Cindy the cat website with photos of her and stick it in object storage or S3, and it would be great. I could use it to distribute con content. I made a new video. I could stick it in object storage and share it with a lot of people. And I can also use object storage for disaster recovery planning. I can take images of my system, pop it into object storage. And you know what else? Big data. So as I mentioned, with object storage, you take your data, you break it down into objects, and you've got metadata. That metadata, which gives you the ability to look in part of the data, not all the data, creation of data lakes, creation of big data environments, analytics, is incredible. So keep that in the back of your mind. Now, Amazon S3 is going to be organized into bucket, and each bucket is really going to be a container for files that are stored on S3. Now, the buckets themselves will have a top-level domain space, meaning you can access it via a fully qualified domain name. We'll get into that later, but a, a URL like any other website can be used to access. So we'll be there. And on the next break, I will show a picture of Cindy the cat since it's requested, and I love sharing Cindy photos. Now, when we name our buckets, they can have up to 63 characters. So we can be pretty descriptive. We can use letters, numbers, hyphens, and periods. Now I want you to understand, we can create a path to it, slash, 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 just like we would before, but that's not really where it's stored. It's just for us. It's like a DNS name for us. It's still stored in the flat environment. So the URL is really just a pointer to get to it. Keep that in the back of your mind. Now, when we secure it, we've got, if we're going to stick our data in S3, we want to secure it. And we kind of have a couple of options that we can use for securing our data. We have a bucket policy, which is the preferred manner. And here you're going to get relatively granular. Joey can access Billy Bob's data from this full, of this type of Billy Bob's data. Sally can access Cindy's data. Richard can access this. So, you know, we can get pretty granular. We can also use traditional Unix permissions, and that's going to be based upon an identity access management policy. I hate the term identity and access management. It's no different than authentication, authorization, accounting. All identity and access management is, is determining who you are, det uh, determining what you're allowed to do, and then keeping track of what you've done afterwards. So we've got a full granular policy to say exactly what you can do with specific data or we can use identity and access management. Now, when we deal with S3 storage tiers, we've got a lot of options. And they're basically different pricing strategies for object storage. So we're going to cover standard S3, 
S3 and frequent access. We'll cover S3 and frequent access one zone. We will cover AWS S3 intelligent tiering, AWS S3 Glacier flexible, and AWS S3 Glacier instant retrieval. So Amazon S3 standard, standard object storage. It's the highest availability, meaning 99.99. The highest durability, the highest performance because it's there. And it's going to be in multiple data centers at minimum. So it's so it should be there when you need it, ideally. And it's used for frequently accessed data. Now, we can also now subscribe to the Amazon S3 and frequent access. Guess what? Same storage, different pricing strategy, same performance and availability. But here's the difference. With Amazon S3 and frequent storage, you use the same storage. You pay less to store your data, but you have to pay to retrieve it. So think about this. It's a cheaper place to put the data that you probably don't need that often. Because if you need it a lot, you're going to pay too much retrieval fees. It'll be cheaper to use Amazon S3. Now, the next kind of storage we're getting to is going to get into this hokey kind of world. Now we're dealing with Amazon S3 and frequent access one zone. So now we've got reduced availability. So before, it was only 99.99% available, meaning five hours of downtime or more a year, like five and a half, five hours, 15 minutes, something like that. So now is you're going to reduce that even more. So you might not have access to your data for 30 hours a year. If that works for you. But the performance is relatively the same. You pay less because your data is less available. Makes it easier for Amazon. They don't have to store your stuff in as many places. And you've got to pay to retrieve it. So again, this is stuff that you don't need that's not super important to you that you're probably not going to access too often because it's lower available. And then there's the auto magic, as they like to call it in tech. I hate auto magic. Auto magic is when Amazon does it for you. They call it intelligent tiering. They analyze your data and move you to where they think is the most cheap and effective. And truth be told, Amazon intelligent tiering does a good job moving your stuff around so you don't pay too much for storage. It does. But I want you to think like an executive. If you're an architect, you are an executive. And your whole point is advising executives on how to improve their business. It is in the cloud provider's best interest for you to spend as much money as possible. That's in their best interest. That's how they live. So anytime they're going to give you something that's going to save you money, it's a conflict of interest for them. So do you want to manually do it and be smart enough to know where your stuff is going to go? Or do you want someone that's got a, that stands to gain from you by charging you more the ability to automatically manage it for you? The better you know your information, the better your systems will run. And I'm saying Amazon's going to do anything wrong intentionally, but there's an inherent conflict of interest or agency problem going on there. So now let's talk about AWS S3 Glacier Instant Retrieval. This is low cost for long-term storage. In fact, it's upwards of 68% cheaper than S3 and frequent access if you don't use your data for at least 90 days. So again, for data you might need, but you don't want to use. And then there's a retrieval fee that you have to deal with to get your data. Now I'm going to talk about one more S3 Glacier Flexible. This is old school Glacier. It is there for data archival purposes. It also has something called a vault lock, which makes your data immutable. What does that mean? It means it can't change. Where does this matter? you got a bank. They've been processing trades for the last seven years, and they have to store all seven trades. They can't be changed after the fact. So they put it in an immutable vault. Now let's talk about another option. You got a doctor that writes a prescription for a patient and the patient's charts are there. That doctor needs to maintain that patient's information for seven years without the ability to change it. Again, vault lock. So for highly regulated injuries, Glacier with a vault lock is a perfect way to archive their data. Now, S3 Glacier Flexible is for data that you're not going to access a lot. How little? One to two times a year. You can get your data in minutes to hours when you need it. It's relatively low cost. It's even 10% less than S3 Glacier Instant Retrieval, but you got to pay for your data retrieval, and you're going to have to request access to your data when you want it. 
Now we're going to talk about the lowest cost type of storage, which is S3 Glacier Deep Archive. This is the lowest cost storage. It's optimized for archiving data that can be received in 12 to 48 hours. It is designed for information that is not accessed more than annually. The data is stored in three or more availability zones and it is designed for long-term storage. And of course, we have the opportunity of S3 lifecycle management. Now, each tier is going to have different cost structures. So lifecycle management enables you to figure it out. So let's say in this particular environment, I knew that I was going to need to access my data every day for 30 days. I'd stick it on S3. Then for another month, I might need it once or twice a week. I put it on an S3 in frequent access. I lower my costs. Then after another 30 days, I know I'm probably not going to get there for a little while. I am going to put it in Amazon Glacier. And I'll keep it there until I need it. And when I need it, I'll pay to retrieve it. Chris, how long has it been since my last break? Well, my team is checking that before I continue to go on. I noticed there's a bunch of questions about the cloud practitioner. We recommend everybody skip the cloud practitioner. There is almost nothing in the cloud practitioner that we recommend anybody learning. We are starting from the complete beginner, which is from less than the cloud practitioner. We'll go almost all the way to the certified solutions architect professional. And there's no reason to take a test, the cloud practitioner, and then take a nearly identical test, which is the solution architect associate. Go straight to the associate in most cases. It'll, it'll save you time. Time is money in your career, and I want you hired sooner and having the scales faster. So generally skip the cloud practitioner. Chris, how long has it been? It's been about 15 to 20 minutes. OK. All right, well, we have a lot more S3 stuff. So let me take a break here, make sure everybody's up to date, and then I'll go back to the S3 content. Which re okay, I'm going to try and understand this, Muhammad. Muhammad, we will talk about NAT, and when we talk about NAT, we will get into this information. This is not related to the content we're discussing right now, but we will get there later in the week. What type of storage is good for cloud apps? You will need all kinds of storage to get everything running. You will just have to choose the right one. If a server needs it, you're going to use block storage. If it's archival and delivery, use object storage. If multiple systems need to use it at the same time, you're going to use file storage. Each application that's developed in the cloud, off the cloud, will have different storage requirements. And you have to understand those storage requirements, the information access, how many times the information needs to be read or write, their performance impact long before you can select a storage type. Does Amazon provide persons that help business decide which storage to use? Well, they do. But let's say you had a bunch of chickens. Would you invite a fox to guard your chickens? Amazon's goal is to sell you as much stuff as they possibly can. Azure stuff is to sell you as much stuff as they possibly can. You need to understand what to do. That's why organizations typically have their own cloud architects, their own enterprise architects that work with AWS, Azure, Cisco, IBM, Microsoft, HP, Accenture, or Palo Alto, Fortinet, and all that stuff's going to be there. And Amazon consultants are only going to recommend Amazon for the most part. So you have to know, have all the knowledge of all the networking and the data center contents to know what you need, and then use them for informational resources. You can't let the vendors design your own networks. They can provide guidance for you. S3 intelligent, intelligent access. So intelligent tiering seems to be auto tiering. That's exactly what it is. It's trying to help you figure out information that you don't have any idea about and put it in the best place. FB, do you think it's ever a good environment for your team not to know what they have and how they're going to use it? Or do you think the better information they have the better they can create their architectures, which can drive better digital transformation. Chris, remind me to bring up some Cindy photos. 
What is the core difference between S3 IA and S3 one zone? Well, S3 in frequent access is in two availability zones, meaning it's 99.99% available, meaning you can access it all but five, and a half, five hours and 15 minutes per year. S3 one zone in frequent access, uh, where they, where they, where they, where they, they means that it's only going to be in one availability zone, which means it's 99.9% .9 active, which means you won't be able to access your data for about 24 hours a year. So the bigger question is, Francis, how much downtime can the business tolerate? I know businesses that lose two dollars a minute when they can't access their systems. Do you think they could wait 24 hours for their data? No. I also know businesses that do nothing in a single day, and if they can't access their system for a day, who cares? So Francis, all this is gonna be based upon the business requirements. What does the business need? A hospital could never afford one zone, ever. People will die if they need access. Likewise, if, they're, if somebody's making handbags and they only produce two a, two a week because they're custom, they could probably afford to be down for a little while. That's your situation, Francis. Business dictates everything. What's the best type of storage for data lakes? Data lakes are typically an object storage, but here's the thing. Whenever we're creating a data lake, Wes, and that's a great question, we're gonna be pulling the information out of data warehouses, like Snowflake. We're gonna be pulling the information out of, uh, what do you call it, NoSQL databases like Apache Cassandra or MongoDB. We're gonna be pulling our information out of relational databases, such as the Oracle database. Then we're going to need some mapping and reduction functions, which is typically done via Python Spark scripts. Then we're going to have to push it into object storage. Then in object storage, we're going to have to typically take our object storage and normalize that with a Python Spark script. Then we're going to have to catalog the data. Then we create our data lake, and then we can run some machine learning on the information in that data lake. So it's a process. But, but a lot of that big data stuff is going to be there. But Again, we're pulling information from relational databases, no SQL databases, which is also going to be on, on block storage. So we're going to be using a combination of storage to do this. Good question. You love how I can help you understand the whole concept. That's why I'm trying to do this. Well, some Cindy photos. Okay, let me show you some Cindy photos. I absolutely love my Cindy. And I've got lots of Cindy photos. Let me pick up a couple little Cindy photos. I actually started do, I started photography as a hobby. I brought a brand new camera. So let me show you some Cindy photos that I've taken in the last week. Don't so make here's a Cindy. Oh, not too many Cindy photos. Okay, I'm just going to do a couple. So here is a Cindy photo that I took very recently. My beautiful little girl over here. She was in the backyard. Uh, if you can share this, Chris. And here's my little Cindy. Little Cindy is sweet, she's loving, she's very soft and she's very gentle. That's a photo of Cindy. I just got a new camera, I've been taking photos. Let me get you one more. And then we'll go back to the content. Let's, uh, so let me get a photo of Cindy. So everybody knows me, knows I love to practice yoga. In fact, I, I practice yoga so much, I have to buy a special yoga mat because I practice yoga with my cat, Cindy, who's more flexible than me even after 17 years of yoga. And here you can see me and my Cindy on my double wide yoga mat. I had to buy a mat specifically for her. This mat actually happens to be eight feet wide and eight feet long. And that way she can sit wherever she decides to sit and I can still practice my daily yoga to stay nice, happy, and calm. <laughs> so there you go. You've got a couple of things. Let me go back to, it looks like I think there's some questions. So let me go back to questions. And thank you so much for that, Wesley. What, what is meant by storage classes? So I'm not going to get into Kubernetes now, but blob is Microsoft branding term for object storage. So blob and S3 are the same. If you are dealing with uh, compute storage like a server, you're going to be using block storage. So block storage is used for compute. Object storage, as I mentioned, was for archival purposes, software distribution, those types of things. File storage is like a hard drive in your computer. 
you store information in the form of files. Object storage is a type of storage area network where you take your data or your files, you turn them into objects, you create some metadata, and you store them in a database-like manner. Completely different storage technology. Good question, David, though. When you say object storage, can it be vanillaized? The same way as an object would be in, in so there are there is definitely applications for storage visualization that are out there, definitely, but uh, not necessarily in the same way. But all these technologies are all old revisions. So, for example, the private VLAN of nineteen or nineteen ninety nine two thousand is very similar to the container that we deal with today. The virtual machine that we use which is the basis of all cloud computing, was technically invented by IBM in the 1970s, where VMware redid it for x86 virtualization in 1999. Exactly the same thing as an EC2 instance. So let's get back to the hashtag. Give me a hashtag so I know you're awake that says cloud is fun or AWS is fun, one of the two. Or you could do cat architect, and I'm fine with a cat architect, too. And remember, please download the completely free AWS Solutions Architect Associate Exam Guide. The link is in my team will pop it in there, and it's also in the description of this video. Please join us tonight for the free question and answer session. We want to help you maximally in your career. And please download the How to Get Your First Cloud Architect Job Webinar. Certification may be 3 to 5% of the, of the entire job. That other 95% is absolutely critical. And I want to make sure you know all those things. So if you train with us, we'd love to train you. If you train somewhere else, I want to know that you're going to get hired. And that's all that matters to me is that you get hired. Now I'm liking some of these hashtags. Cloud is fun and AWS is fun. Okay, so as I mentioned, object storage is good for re write once, read many times. And why? Whenever you're dealing with traditional object storage before anybody changed it for the cloud, anytime you create or modify a version, you create a new one. So I want you to think about this. Create one, like you created a Word document. Then you saved it a minute later. If you use saved in an object storage, you're going to have a new version. Saved it another minute later, you'll have a new one. Saved it another. So if you saved it a thousand times, you'll have a thousand versions. Now, that will fill up your storage very quickly, and it will get very expensive. So what the cloud providers did is they created some automation on their side to stop that normal behavior. And then they wanted to sell you an extra feature called AWS versioning. And all AWS versioning is, is it turns on the versions that were enabled by object storage in default. But now you subscribe to it. And here's the key. If you made a document, it will save every single version. And why is that so great? I create a version, then I give it to somebody on my team. They make a mistake. Guess what? Now I lost it. But if, I, if every time it was saved, I've got a new version, I may have a 1,000 versions of a document. And then I may, may need to go back to version 967 should something happen, and that's what happens with versioning. So versioning is normal. The cloud providers disable it by default. And ultimately, in the process, we, lose some ver we, we uh, can re-enable it, and therefore, we keep our information. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is multi-factor authentication delete. Think about this. You're going to store your information on the cloud, right? What if a hacker gets access to the cloud and wants to start deleting your data? Is this good? Or have any of you by accident ever deleted your data? I know I have. Not often. Now, usually Cindy deletes my data because she, she clicks on something I don't know how she does it. She walks on my keyboard with her paws and she deletes data, which is fine for me because I store it in two different storage area networks 
one in my house, one in my brother's house, because it's a lot cheaper for me to build my own cloud than it was to use somebody else's cloud, but I pop it into two different clouds. So there's a way around that, and that's called multi-factor authentication delete. And basically, here's what happens. You want to go delete something. You click delete. Next, you're sent a challenge. You provide a one-time password, and then the system is deleted. So my little Cindy, she's a little wild, rambunctious little child. Cindy's going on the computer. She's pushing stuff with her paws, and she deletes this book that I've been writing for the last three years. Obviously, I'm not going to be thrilled. And then Cindy will look at me with cute eyes and I'll forgive her. But what will happen is she's going to try to delete this thing and I'm going to get a text message. Do I want to delete this? And I'm going to say no. And then Cindy can no longer delete my stuff. So I love multi-factor authentication delete. So Cindy, in this case, was a gentle accidental hacker. But it can prevent a hacker or it can prevent you from making major mistakes. Oops, not where I was trying to go. Now, the next thing I want you to think about is remember, Object storage is not real storage. It's not like you can store it in a database or anything like that. It's not real. It is basically a big giant database of storage, a big flat environment where you take your data, break it down into an object, and you put a pointer to it. Now, you can create a delimiter. And I'm going to pop in a delimiter in the chat box so you can see. I can store my data to make it feel like Unix data. Let me pop it in the chat box to give you an example. So you can see what I did here is I put Mike slash 2020 slash AWS video slash storage slash S3.mp4. I could do that. And that's going to look like a Unix path. It's going to help me as a human understand where it's at. And it's going to make it feel more like file storage to me. But that's actually not where it's stored. That's only enabling me to see it there as a like URL. So I can make it look like it's not a database, which is what I just did there. But remember, it is there in a URL-based format. We can just make things look like URLs or make things make look like a link for us. But that's not where it's going to be stored in the actual database. Now, encrypting data. We're going to put our stuff in S3. We need to encrypt it. And there was lots of ways we used to encrypt it in the past. Understand that in today's world, for the most part, encryption is pretty much automatic. I believe AWS changed that recently. But in case the test hasn't caught up, I'm going to actually talk about how to do it. So on S3, we've got a protect, we want to protect our sensitive data, and there's two ways to deal with it. There's the client side and the server side. Typically, the way we would have encrypted things is through the key management system. And the key, key management system is a complete key management solution. Basically, what happens is the users are going to manage their master key, and the key manage system will manage the data key. And the key management systems out there will provide an audit trail of who, how, and when the data was accessed. You know, you can look at it this way. When you're using the standard key management system, we're going to have one option. They call it SSE-Key Management Steps. And we're using the key management system. We manage our master key. AWS manages our data key. And then we would use that to access our encrypted data. Now, we could also have AWS managed keys, which is called SSE-S3. Now, this is going to be a complete and total key management solution. The key management system will manage every single key you have, which is great. It's an automatic key rotation, which is also great, and every object is encrypted with unique identifier. Here's the thing. You have no control. In some environments, that will work. and some environments, that's not secure enough. But here's what it's going to look like. You've got your key management system with your master key. They manage the data key. And that's all there for your data. Now, some environments require very high security. And in these environments, you may need to manage all the keys. And in AWS terms, that's SSE-C. Yeah, SSE 
And that's where you manage all of your keys. So let's talk a little bit about some object storage tuning. And here we're going to get into pre-signed URLs, multi-part uploads, range gets, as well as cross-region replications. First thing I want you to understand is that everything in S3 is theoretically private, meaning it's not accessible unless you make it public. So if you want to give somebody access to your private stuff, you got to give it to them. Now, there's lots of ways you can do this, but the simplest thing is to send a pre-signed URL. Basically what happens is you create and sign a URL with your encryption key. You assign it, you pre-sign it. And that way, I got 30 photos of, that I took of Cindy yesterday. Believe me, I took more than 30. And I want to send them to Chris, my chief operating officer. He likes cats. He's got a beautiful cat named Sonny. And I can pre-sign a link. I can send him the link, and he can download them without going through any content complex. Temporary access to the desired photos of Cindy the cat. Now, when we pre-sign our URLs, the way we pre-sign them is going to determine how long the links are there before they expire. If we sign it with our identity and access instance profile, our username, so to speak, it's good for six hours. If we sign it with a security token service, it's good for 36 hours. As if an IAM user signs it, it can be done for up to seven days. And we can issue a temporary token, which means as soon as it expires, meaning I can issue a token. It could expire an hour from now. So, you know, if a hacker were to get it, what are they going to use with it? So we have to choose the best option based upon our business needs. Next concept is a multi-part upload. So let's say you were taking photos of videos. With my 8K video camera, I take a five-minute video of Cindy, and it's like 30 gigs. But, well, that, so, you know, it's going to be a big file. And uh, AWS will let you hold an object as big as five terabytes, but you can upload a file that's five gigs. And they may have changed it. It could have gotten bigger, but it was five gigs. So here's the thing. Let's say I wanted to send a five gig video. And I send 4.97 gigs. My internet connection dies. All the data that I send is completely lost. And I have to send all five gigs again. Now, some people like me have ultra high speed internet connections and I've got multiple for business reasons, but some people don't. If the internet connection is overloaded, it might take you know 30 minutes to send that five gig, 60 minutes. And then if I lose it, I got to start all over and I wasted another hour. So the multi-part upload, and it's recommended as part of AWS best practices, anytime you've got a file above 100 megs, use what's called a multi-part upload. Now, multi-part uploads are awesome. They are wonderful. And here's really what it is. Let's say you got your file. What happens is the multi-part upload will chop the file into little mini files, and it'll send them as parts of the file. Part one, part two, part three, all the way to say part 99. Part one will get sent, and it'll say, I've got part one. Part two is getting sent, it's got part two. Now, if any of the parts are lost, instead of sending the entire file all over, you only send the lost parts. So I happen to love multi-part uploads. I think they are awesome. The last thing we want to talk about is cross-region replication. So why would you do this? There's a couple of reasons. If I've got all my data in the US, what happens if the US goes down? I could pop it in, the, in, in a European region. Now, the reality is the chance of the US and Europe going down at the same time are a lot greater than AWS and Azure going down at the same time. So, you know. If you're, if you're concerned about availability of your data, you're probably better multi-cloud. But let's say you've got a static website in the US and you've got users of that same website in Japan. And every time they go from Japan to the US, you're paying cross-region network charges on the cloud, which could get very expensive. 
With cross-region replication, we could have an S3 bucket in Japan and an S3 bucket in the US, and people in Japan will access Japan, and people in the US will access the US, and guess what? We're not paying to send our data across the world. So cross-region replication lets us replicate our data in real time to make sure every bucket that we have in one part of the world is replicated dynamically in the rest of the world. We might do that for availability of data. We might do it to make sure that uh, we can reduce inter-region uh, and networking costs, but there's lots of things that we might need to do in the cloud, and that's there. So now let's talk about server storage or the ephemeral storage in the servers. <laughs> when, you, when you build a server, the server's got hard drives in it. Now I'm gonna make it very clear, because when we get to AWS, I'm gonna, I'm gonna lie and tell you it's fast. Actually, I'm not gonna lie. AWS is gonna lie and I'm gonna give you the comparison of the speed. Now block storage, which we'll do next, is the fastest storage we get on the cloud, but it is really slow compared to the storage that's inside of your server. So instant storage, which some people call ephemeral storage, is the storage that's inside the physical server that's housing the EC2 instances. This is really fast. How fast? I can get a RAID card that does 19 million IOPS. That's really, really fast inside of my system. The servers are typically eight NVMe drives in RAID, so they are typically really, really fast. But the problem with instant storage is it's inside the server. If we delete that server, it is all gone. So that is instant storage. It's the storage in the server. It's the fastest storage we can use but it doesn't matter because it's lost. Now in your data center, you can use your own servers and you can get the highest performance storage, much cheaper than the cloud. How much cheaper? For about a hundred bucks at Best Buy, we can get storage which will cost us thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars a month. So keep that in the back of your mind. Instant storage is really, really fast. The kind of instant storage is what you have in your notebook computer, for example, but it's directly in your system and there's some challenges with that. So we will get into block storage or elastic block storage next. Now, block storage is what's used in all cloud providers. Azure may call it a managed disk. AWS calls it elastic block storage because if you wanna know is an AWS, stick the word elastic in it, it probably is your answer. And we're gonna talk about block storage being high performance because we have to, because it's going to be what's on your certification exam. It's not. It's going to look and feel like a virtual hard drive to a server. It's where you're going to store your databases. It's where you're going to, all your servers are going to store the things. It's very scalable, because remember, block storage can be anywhere you want, as long as you've got IP connectivity to it, which is why it's great. It's not deleted when you have instance, when you have got, when you lose instance termination. It's relatively high. Um, it's relatively high performance. There's the best we're going to get on the cloud by comparison, and I'll give you the differences. And it's high availability, meaning 99.99, which means much better than uh, object st object storage, which is 99.99. Think five minutes of downtime per year. Relatively good. So. We're gonna say that on the cloud, we're gonna use block storage for high throughput and high transaction workloads because that's where we're gonna use it. We're gonna have multiple performance options. All are gonna be slow by comparison to data center solutions. Avail block elastic block storage is inside of a single availability zone or data center, but it's backed up to another data center or availability zone for high availability. Now, where good news is, and we've got a block storage volume, Amazon and the other cloud providers do the most beautiful backup in the world. They literally create a snapshot of the data. And that is a bit by bit copy of the identical hard drive. <laughs> I want you to understand how good this is. This means you got a, you got a virtual hard drive, block storage drive, ABS volume. You get an image of it. If you want to launch it later, you take that image and you just launch the server and it's got everything as you had before other than a different IP address. It is unbelievable, the best backups in the world. 
But we're going to have to size our, and determine our EBS volume types by performance requirements, by latency, and by throughput. So let's talk about storage performance. We basically have two things that we consider latency and throughput, and they're not the same. Latency is inversely correlated to the number of times we can read and write to the disk per second. That's called input and output operations per second. The faster we can do it, the faster we can write, the less latency per write. Throughput is the amount of stuff we can push. So I'm in Port St. Lucie, Florida. Let's say I've got two vehicles. Vehicle one is a Ferrari, and I try to drive to New York City as fast as possible. That is faster, right? Now, my other car is a tractor trailer, and I can fill it with stuff. Which do you think can take more stuff to New York in, the same, in, in, in 48 hours? The Ferrari, which can go up and back to New York maybe twice and fill up the trunk or the boot with a little bit of stuff, or the tractor trailer that can get there a little bit slower, but it can take you know thirty thousand metric ton or thirty metric tons of stuff with it. That's so throughput is the amount of stuff you can push, and latency is how fast you can read and write. Otherwise, re re referred to as input and output operations per second. It's like anything else; you choose the right vehicle for the job. Mind you, you can get a nineteen million IOPS RAID card for about three hundred grand. You can't, uh, uh, to get to 19 million IOPS on the cloud or even a million IOPS on the cloud is really challenging and very expensive. So the fastest block storage we have in AWS is EBS provision IOPS, specifically called IO2. Now this is AWS's fastest storage, its lowest latency, and they will tell you that it's designed for workloads that require high input and output, like a large database or a low latency application. You can get up to 4,000 megabit per second and up to a quarter of a million I IOPS. So 19 million IOPS on a RAID card in the server, upwards of a quarter of a million IOPS in AWS. You determine which is faster. Up to you. Next, the next fastest EBS volume type, EBS provision IOPS IO1. Now, this is the highest performance. Uh, this is relatively high performance SSD, relatively low latency, designed for workloads that require a moderately high input and output per second, like a database. This gives us up to 1,000 megabit a second and up to 64,000 IOPS. These are pretty expensive. Compare this to the hard drive in my Mac notebook, which can do 6,000 megabit per second versus this 1,000, and far more than 64K IOPS. Now, mind you, these things are going to get real expensive real fast in the cloud, this kind of storage, and it is still relatively slow. So if you've got ultra high performance environments, we're going to get it, have to get into RAID. We're going to have to get into something other than EBS, and we're going to need to deal with external storage vendors. Now, the next type of storage volume we have is something called EBS General Purpose SSD, otherwise known as GP2. And this is general purpose SSD storage. It's going to give us a good balance of price and performance. Great for a boot volume, because it's going to stay after a reboot. Somewhat high IOPS and moderate throughput, about 250 megabit a second. So transactional workloads, dev test. My Mac can do 6,000 megabit a second. My Threadripper workstation in RAID 2 can do about 12,000 megabit a second, and that's for my own personal use. And this one gives you 250 megabit a second. So I want to put it into context for you so you can understand. And I want you to know, because if you try to talk to a CIO, and say so I've got these really fast block storage volumes, and they ask you what it can do and you tell them, they'll escort you out the door by security. Now, if you tell them it's the fastest option we can get on the cloud, they're going to be thrilled with you because they want to know that you have the wisdom to know the difference. That's another reason organizations use hybrid clouds. The level of performance we can do in the data center is much higher than we can do here. So hybrid, that's one of the reasons. Now, the next is magnetic storage. You know, those old hard drives that go when they spin. And it's going to be the lowest cost 
low IPS. Now, believe it or not, these throughput optimized hard drives are relatively good. They give you 500 megabit a second. So some video editors could actually work with storage like that. Now, the input and output of magnetic storage is really bad. So very low IOPS. Kind of keep that in the back of your mind. And, uh, you know, it's going to be ideal to store data where low latency doesn't matter. So great for logs, that kind of thing. And then the last kind of storage we're going to talk about is EBS cold hard drive, which is going to be the lowest cost, the lowest IOPS, moderate throughput of 250 megabit, so workloads that are not going to be accessed frequently. Now, if we're going to deal with hard drives that are relatively slow, how do we speed them up? We use RAID. And uh, what do we mean by that? So we're going to talk about RAID, which is called the Redundant Array of Inexpensive Disks. And what it does much like a link aggregation group, it's going to enable us to bundle multiple drives, either hard drives, block storage volumes, and make them look like a single drive. So if we have four 10 gig ethernet connections and we bundle them together, now we've got 40 gigs. Well, guess what? If by comparison, if we've got four drives and each one can only do 250,000 IOPS, and we need a million IOPS, maybe we put four of them together, or four of them together and four backup, which we'll get to in a minute. So RAID is going to enable us to get higher speed and higher performance and uh, larger amounts of storage. Now, normally, we're going to deal with RAID 0, RAID 1, RAID 5, and RAID 10. But We're not going to discuss RAID 5 here. Well, we'll discuss it, but understand you can't use RAID 5 on AWS because block storage is so slow and it has so much latency. RAID 5, for redundancy purposes, will add additional latency. So we're going to use RAID 0, RAID 1, and RAID 10, and we'll show you what, when to use each. So here's all RAID 0 is. We're going to take two hard drives, and we're going to put them together. It's called striping. We're going to put our first piece of storage on the drive one as block one, next piece of storage in block two, third piece of storage in hard drive one, second piece of storage in um, on hard block four on hard drive two. And by sharing the data going back and forth between the drives, we've got really great performance. Only one problem here. With RAID zero, two hard drives, 50% of the data on one drive, 50% of the data on the other drive, lose drive one, we lose it all. Now, we could put far hard drives in RAID 0, too, and put it all on four drives, which is going to give us much more speed. But if we lose any of the drives in the RAID array, we lose all of our data. So not so good. So RAID 0, super high speed. But here's the problem. We lose any of the volumes. We are done. We are dead in the water. We've got nothing. So RAID 0 is generally considered too risky for the enterprise. And uh, the exception is maybe we use it for video editing, uh, can be used with EBS volumes. So kind of think about RAID 0 being a little spooky. So now let's talk about RAID 1. I love RAID 1. I use RAID 1. Well, actually, I use RAID 10 for things, but I'll show you what RAID 1 is. So if RAID 0 puts half of your data on two drives, RAID 1 is just a copy. Why do I like it? Because 1 is none, 2 is 1, and 3 is greater than 2. I've got two hard drives sitting in my system, and they're in RAID 1. Hard drive 1 copies everything to hard drive 2. They are identical. They are a mirror. I lose hard drive 1. No big deal. I switch over to hard drive 2 by breaking the mirror, and I'm still up and running with a perfect copy of my hard drive. So RAID 1, super high availability. RAID 0, super high speed. Now, RAID 5, which is really what the enterprise uses, is a combination of the two or something different. In RAID 5, what we typically do is we need at least three drives, and we put data 
let's in this environment, I put data on three of the four drives and I put backup data on the fourth drive. And then the next time I write on the first two drives, put backup data on the third drive and then real data on the fourth drive. And then the next time I might put backup data on the second drive and I'll date on the third. The point with RAID 5 is we're striping, meaning we're, we're using multiple drives and we're putting backup data or parity data. So I've got four hard drives. One of them fails. I take out the bad hard drive. I pop in a brand new hard drive and I rebuild it and poof, we're up and running. And some flavor of RAID 5 is typically what you see in the data center. Maybe 50, but or, but it's really, or 60, but it's pretty much the same thing. Now, the next type of RAID that we're going to talk about is RAID 10, which is what we're going to be using in high availability and high performance environment. If you recall, RAID 0 gives you the performance you need by connecting multiple storage volumes together. But you lose one hard drive in the RAID, and there you lose everything. Now here with RAID 10, we have two RAID zeros. We've got a primary RAID zero environment, which gives us the highest performance. And we have a backup RAID zero. And what we do is we copy between them like RAID 1. So we're doing RAID or RAID 1, that mirroring, between two different RAID zero RAID arrays. By doing so, we get the highest performance and the highest redundancy. So now you know the types of RAIDs. RAID zero, stripe, two drives, three drives, four drives, Maximum speed. RAID 1, take one drive, back it up to another drive. So you got identical copies. RAID 10, RAID 0, RAID 0, RAID 1 between them, and poof, high performance, high availability storage. Okay, so before we get into elastic file storage, which is file storage, I figure it's time I probably should get to some questions. Can my SQL database object storage be stored so another world to run increment of backup? I don't understand your question. So my SQL is going to be on block storage and it's going to be archived to object storage. But perhaps if you word the question differently, I'll understand it. I'm not really sure I understand what you mean. So let's go to the next one. How is a token created? When we get to the token creation service, we will we will discuss the token creation process because it's pretty intensive. Is instant storage a form of block storage? No, instant storage is file storage sitting inside the system. It is not block storage. Block storage is a storage area network. What does a storage area network look like? You're typically seeing boxes that are full of hard drives that have a processor to manage it and some RAID cards, but no, they're totally different technologies. Yo, guess what's the reason for S3 to discontinue the Torrent protocol? I don't know why anybody would be using the Torrent protocol for anything in a business environment. So it wouldn't make sense to me that they even have it. Multi-part uploads would do that perfectly. Hey, Hunt, yeah, anytime you have a virtual machine, it's going to use block storage. Anytime you want to back it up, you're going to use object storage. And file storage is when you need multiple people to see the same system information at the same time. We'll get into file storage next, but block, any virtual machine is going to use block storage. Anytime you want to back up, distribute software, that kind of thing is going to be object storage. And file storage is, let's say I've got one server and I need 100 clients to access the information, 1,000 or 100,000 clients. That's going to be file storage. It's going to be hierarchical and like stored in folders. Good question. Do businesses use RAID 10 or RAID 500? Look, what they end up using is it's all going to be either 0, 1, or 10, 5, or 10. But then they have RAID 50 and other things. So, you know, what you're really dealing with is RAID 5 is typically one drive. I believe it's RAID 6 if you have two backup drives. RAID 50 is when you've got a combination of RAID 10 of, of RAID 5. So they're all one flavor of the same. So yes, I've seen people use multiple hierarchical RAIDs. They may take a bunch of RAID 5 arrays and stripe them together. They may take a bunch of RAID 0 arrays and stripe them together. So yeah, you'll see all these flares. Absolutely. 
Is there a RAID 6? I believe RAID 6 is RAID 5 with two extra hard drives instead of one. Any specific use case for RAID 10? Well, block storage is really slow. So anytime you need speed, you're either going to have to go to, say, Sun. Uh, what is it? Sun, what is it? NetApp. They can then figure out how to make uh, FSX for Lustre look fast and look like block storage through a translation protocol, or you're going to have to use RAID 0. But RAID 0 is too risky. So anytime you need a better performance than, uh, than block storage can provide, which is pretty much very frequently, you'll be using RAID 10. Does RAID have a maximum live at IOPS? Well, what are the IOP? What's the limit of the drives that you have and the RAID card and the computational power of the RAID card? You know, there's one out there right now that can do 19 million IOPS. It's the fastest in the world. And it actually uses a very high performance GPU to actually schedule the reads and writes to the drives. So there's, there's always going to be a compute limit. The question is, what is that? Next year's GPU is twice as strong, and instead of doing 19 million, it can do 38 million. But we're always going to run into a hardware limit. It's never the it's always the hardware. <laughs> Please elaborate on flap. So yeah, sure. That's gonna it's a bit of a hard topic. So let me try and draw it out for you. And we're gonna we'll compare it to file storage. So in a traditional environment, here's what you're gonna have. You're gonna have, let's say this is file storage. You're gonna have a root directory. Under the root directory, you're gonna have a couple of things, but let's say you've got a home directory. And under the home directory, you're gonna have, let's say on your system, you'll have a you'll have a movies, you'll have, let's say, give you another one. You'll have a document, and then underneath your, let's say you've got a photos. Now under your documents, you might have uh, AWS, and then inside of AWS, you might have 20 other things. That's traditional storage, and it's organized, literally speaking, in folders. This is file storage. With object storage, here's what you got. You got all this stuff. You got AWS. You got home. You've got uh, documents. And it's just sitting there. And the only way you know how to find it is there's a there's basically an internal chart. And the internal chart says, hey, to reach Mike's AWS documents, go here. So that's what it's meant by flat. There's no hierarchy. There's no structure. It's just literally, it's like, it's like having a person that provides directions. How do I get here? Go that way. How do I get here? Go take a rocket ship. How do I go here? Go under the ground. So that's the difference between object storage, which is a pointer to the data, versus hierarchical storage, which literally stores it in a real structure? Good question. Naveed, I have no idea what you're actually asking there. There's a massive difference between block storage and object storage. It has absolutely, I don't know what you're asking. It only has to do with the way the technology is. They are both RAID arrays. They are both giant boxes that are filled with hard drive. One takes your data, breaks it down into objects, and is only good for read once, write once, read many times. The other is usable and mountable by servers. Normally speaking, there'd be no purpose for object storage whatsoever other than backup and archival purposes or basically just sticking your stuff in a low cost environment. Computers can't use it. Block storage will always be used by your virtual machines and your servers. So maybe that kind of helps you. 
So S3 is object storage. What about those folders? There's no such thing as a folder in object storage. The folders are only for our brain. File storage has folders. Object storage has no concept. We just stick it there and we produce a pointer to it. Like, okay, the high availability direct connection says two direct connect, two routers, two ISPs, and two power sources. The exam guide has just one from the organization of the AWS switch. Why? Because we're writing a book, and in the book, we wrote it to follow the AWS specifications. In the concept, the way I talk to you here, I said, here's what AWS recommends, and here's how we really want you to do it to be accurate. So when I'm teaching you this, I'm giving you the actual, how you might actually want to do it in real life, and I'm giving the real information. In that book, we wrote it purely as a certification guide. What I'm doing here is to try and educate you both to pass the certification and also to help you make better architectural decisions. That book is a written document, and as a written document, we had to make it very specific, very to the point, because I couldn't provide the explanations that I'm providing you here and now. Good question, though. Okay, so let's get back, but I want to know you're awake. So if you just joined us, join us tonight. We're going to go on Zoom for a bit, and I'll be able to clarify any questions that you may have. If you have any desire to become a cloud architect, please download the completely free How to Get Your First Cloud Architect job guide. And... Uh, Get the completely free ebook to help you pass the AWS Solutions Architect Associate and Professional exams, all free for you. And my team is going to pop it in there. And give me a hashtag, a fun AWS training. Yeah, that's the hashtag, fun AWS training. Well, I know you're awake. I see people are coming in. Cats rule. I love that. Yes, I definitely believe cats rule. I'm totally okay with that anytime. Fun AWS training. Now we're talking. Okay, so now let's get into the elastic file system. So the elastic file system is another marketing term. If any of you come from a Linux or a Unix environment and uh, you've ever worked with a network file system invented by Sun Microsystems, now Oracle, guess what? You understand the Elastic File System. The AWS Elastic File System is an AWS branded version of the 20 several year old NFS NFS file system that we've been using for Linux and Unix shares for decades. So all it is is AWS managed storage. Now you could easily take a server, a Linux server, create a share, and then share that with the rest of your virtual machines on the cloud in the data center like we've done for the last four decades. Or we could go to the cloud, and we could just say, I want to use the AWS Elastic File System. Same thing, no different. So when we're dealing with the Elastic File System, of course, we've got two versions, standard and infrequent access. Standard, stuff you're going to use a lot. Infrequent access, stuff you're not. We're also going to have two options, which is burstable and provision throughput. Here's normal. I've got access. I might need a little more. My traffic might look like this, and it semi-accommodates if there's performance in the system. Here's the alternative provision. I tell it I need this much, and I'm guaranteed. All we got to really think about from that, I want to make it as easy as possible. Now, Elastic, the Elastic file system is what's called post six compatible, meaning it works with old school Linux and Unix file systems, no big deal. You might see an exam provide a post six compatible file system, Elastic file system. It scales pretty well. 
and it actually will auto scale itself, which is really nice about the Elastic file system. Normally with NFS file shares, you gotta know what you need. You run out of space, you add an extra hard drive, you create a new share, so be it. Resize the bar. Here, the AWS Elastic file systems kind of resize themselves on demand, which is very convenient. Again, you pretty much should know your data anyway, and if you don't know your data, you're gonna run into long-term problems, cost problems, architecture problems, so you always need to know, but it's kind of nice that it dynamically scales on demand for you. So people ask when would you would use file storage. So let's say you got a bunch of web servers that all want to serve the same stuff. Now you could clone the block storage volumes that are in each of them, or you could create a file server and all the servers can mount the file server at the mount point, And then they can all access the same information at the same time. Now you understand uh, what, do you call, what do you call it? The file servers. Now let's say you want to share files with Windows systems. Well, Windows uses the server message block protocol and Linux uses the NFS system. So Amazon also has fully managed Windows servers for you if you wanted. And that's called the Amazon FSX for Windows file system. And uh, when we're dealing with this, we're dealing with servers that are Microsoft servers that Amazon manages, and they run the standard server box message protocol. It's hosted on Windows servers that AWS manages for you, which means you lose control, which means you get simplicity and elegance, but you lose control. And there is an architectural trade-off for losing control, a big one, versus the flexibility, so you determine if it's right, it's no different than going to a restaurant and ordering food versus cooking it yourself. It's a control issue. And because they're Windows servers, they'll support Microsoft file system features like quotas and Active Directory. And of course, when we're dealing with Windows systems, they basically provide encryption in transit and at rest. And, you know, it's pretty simple. You want to set this thing up. All you do is you go to Amazon FSX. You create a file system, you configure the file shares that you're going to use, and you're going to connect it to your, your systems. That's it. Pretty simple to use. Now, let's say you need high performance storage on the cloud. You'll recall I told you that block storage is relatively slow compared to data center storage. And at some point, are you going to have 50? AWS IO2 block volumes in RAID 0 and another 50 in another RAID 0 to do RAID 10 and pay $10 million a month for your storage. Now, there's really two options. One is go back and do the high performance stuff in the data center. It'll be much cheaper. But let's say you want to do it on the cloud. This is where we get into this Amazon FSx for Lustre. And this is an ultra high performance file system it can give you very high IOPS, hundreds of gigabits per second of throughput, some bi-directional synchronization, and we can even synchronize it with S3 buckets. So if we need really high performance in the cloud, the cloud providers know that what we have access to is pretty slow. And because they know we have access to things that are pretty slow, they give us the option for Amazon FSx for Lustre. And of course, we can work with this directly, or there are storage partners. Uh, NetApp has a great product. They can take Amazon FSx for Lustre, make it look and feel, for example, like block storage. But you know, anytime we're dealing with this, it's never going to be just AWS or just Azure or just Google. Any architecture may have 100 different vendors' technology in it. And that's called the best of breed. We use the best technology from all the people we need to, the best environments in the world to deliver the maximum performance for our customers. So now that we talked about all the storage systems, we have to talk about getting data to AWS. So let's talk about getting our data to AWS. Now there's a lot of ways we can get it. So we're gonna talk about some of the options. The first option is gonna be what's called a storage gateway. So you got all this data in your data center. And now you want to get it to AWS, right? 
the easiest, one of the easiest options is a storage gateway. Now, what is it? You create, you put a server in your data center. It's going to be a virtual machine. And that virtual machine is going to be connected to the AWS cloud. So if you've got a hybrid cloud and you want to keep your data synchronized between your cloud and your data center, this is beautiful. It's great for disaster recovery. Back up all your stuff from your data center to the cloud. Beautiful. Or if you're going to do a cloud migration and you've got sufficient time, this is also excellent. And there's going to be a couple different storage gateways, and I'll discuss all three, and I'll show you. There'll be a file gateway. There'll be a volume gateway in stored mode, a volume gateway in cache mode. They're going to level the you leverage the iSCSI protocol to connect to the to these devices for storage. We and uh, we probably will discuss the tape gateway and even how to do backups to AWS. But let's talk about first about the file gateway. The file gateway is in a appliance, if you want to call it that, virtual machine more specifically, that's going to be a local file server in your data center. And it's going to support the following protocols. NFS to connect to your Unix and Linux systems, and SMB or server message block to connect to your Windows systems. We will copy the data to this file server, and it's going to get copied asynchronously to the cloud. So put a server in your data center, Copy your stuff to the storage, it synchronizes with AWS. That's a storage gateway, specifically the file gateway. Pops in an AWS and it gets encrypted with server side encryption, SSE S3. Let's look like architecturally very, very similar. <laughs> Got, let's say, our servers and our storage gateway. As you can see, we mount our servers to the storage gateway. Now we've got a direct connection or a VPN to the cloud. The storage gateway will, will take that information and it will move it over to AWS S3 for us. That is how a traditional storage gateway works, a file gateway. Now, or now we're going to get into the volume gateways. These are going to give us a little more options and do a little more cool stuff. The first thing we're going to put talk about is a volume gateway in stored mode. Now, this is really great for organizations who keep their data in their own data center primarily, and they want to back up to the AWS cloud. Data center goes down, they want the cloud as a backup. Essentially, we put the storage gateway in our data center. And by doing so, we put stuff on the storage gateway, and it will copy it to the AWS cloud. Now, that's pretty cool as far as, as far as I'm concerned. We copy it to the data center. Now, this photo doesn't look so great. In black, I had a white background on my screen, but I needed to change the background because we were getting some artifact on our video. But basically, we are here. We're yellow. We put our information on the storage gateway, and it copies it to AWS automatically for us. Now, this is kind of cool. Let's talk about the Viam Gateway Cache Node. Now, this is if we're going to have mostly our stuff on AWS. This is pretty cool, too. So the Cache Mode, basically, we keep our data in AWS. We keep this storage gateway in our data center. And then remember, computers can't mount object storage or S3. But we've got a data center, we've got a lot of data in S3, and hence we've got the Viam Gateway Cache Mode. So we're in our data center, we want information from the AWS cloud, we go get it through our direct connection or our VPN, and it's put on a server, which is the Viam Gateway Cache Mode. Now, why is it so cool? Well, if we go to this particular environment where I'm over here and I request information from AWS, it then gets put on this Viam gateway, which is cached, and it's stored there. So me, I pull information on Tuna, because I'm interested in creating a Tuna website for cats all across the world. So here I am, the red dot in the upper left-hand corner. I get some information that's, that's, stuck, that's housed in AWS. It comes back to me in the red. Now, five minutes later, there's this cat, um, Elsa the Lion. And Elsa the Lion is very interested in buying large tunas. So Elsa the Lion then goes to the information 
Um, she's now a red dot two. She hits the local network. She hits the Viam gateway cache mode and the information is already stored locally because she's getting the same information else of the lion that Mike, uh, the lion lover, actually requested an hour ago. So it's basically caching our information. So it enables us to keep our data in AWS. And while we keep our data in AWS, we can access it through the gateway. Gateways translate one form of storage to another storage and it caches it so we don't have to use the network as much, reducing our network bandwidth and our network cost. So, okay. So we basically can set up a server. The server themselves and any of the VIAM gateways send stuff over our network. Well, what if we don't have a lot of network bandwidth? And what if we don't have sufficient time to send it over there? Well, enter the world of the snowball. What is a snowball? It's a rugged computer. AWS ships it to you. So they basically ship you a server in this hard, ruggedized box. You plug that server into your network. You copy all the information on that server. You ship it and you send it back to AWS. And then they transfer it to object storage. Now, typically you can think of 80 terabytes, although after you format it, 72 terabytes is usable. It's got some moderately high speed networking, 10 gigs. To at a 10 gig link, you're dealing pretty quickly with you know populating 80 ter or 72 terabytes, which is nothing when we're talking data, and you send it there. So this is pretty easy. The way I'd like to look at it is as follows. You want to send your data to AWS? You call them, they ship you a snowball. They, uh, you load your data on it, you, sh you sh call AWS, they pick it up, and they copy it on for you. It's a pretty simple and elegant solution, honestly. Now let's talk about a snowmobile. So if a snowball is a ruggedized computer that handles you know 70 terabytes of data, what if you've got 200 terabytes? Well, you get three snowballs, no big deal. Now, let's say you want to move a big data center. Well, if you've got a big data center to move to the cloud, the, enter the AWS Snowball. So AWS drives you on a tractor trailer, this big giant shipping container that's 45 feet long, and it's packed with servers and hard drives. It stores up to 100 petabytes of storage. It's a data center on wheels. So. AWS drives you this big tractor trailer with this giant filled of hard drives. You copy your information onto it, and then they drive it back to AWS, and the data is copied on there. So, you know, snowball, probably a good thing. Snowmobile, giant tractor trailer full of stuff. And uh, that's it. Now, let's look at the most simple and elegant next. Now we're gonna talk about the import and export service. So here's what it is. Here, you got a rental hard drive from AWS, you plug it into your server, you copy the stuff on, and then you ship it back to AWS. So that's it, that's your three options. Snowball, think 70 terabytes, moderately big. Snowmobile, think they ship you a tractor trailer that's a computer on wheels, you copy your data over. Import, export service, you send them a hard drive. That is it. That is it. So now we're going to talk about Amazon Work Documents for a minute. And this is a tough one for me. So Amazon Work Document, Work Docs, is a fully secured, fully managed, secure content creation environment, software storage collaboration service. It's like Google Drive and, Go and Dropbox. It enables collaboration on creative projects. It enables shared document editing. It is relatively simple, affordable, and it's accessed via web client. In effect, you can think of, to me, I view it as a, as, as a, as a competitor to these Dropboxy Google Drive slash Microsoft 365 solutions. I don't like I don't like to talk about this too much because Amazon themselves is using Microsoft Office 365. They just made a very large deal with Microsoft to use it for their own employees. So this is a service that Amazon makes to compete with those, but they're using the Microsoft service themselves. So think about that architecturally if you were ever going to recommend Amazon WorkDocs. 
Microsoft, they're using the Microsoft version themselves, not their own. So keep that in the back of your mind. I don't know how to tell you what, how, how you decide that, but no. So today we covered storage, networking, and everywhere in between. The next thing we need to get to is compute. We've got a lot of things to cover in compute, but I think it's, that's going to take me 45 minutes to an hour to do that. Chris, how much more time do we have today? Because it may just be best to go to questions. Yes. So we've got 15 minutes left on this. And then we've got uh, the extra hours. Okay. So let me answer some questions right now. And then I hope to see a lot of you on Zoom tonight. So we can really get deep because, you know, there's only a, a certain number of questions we can and things we can address inside of a chat box. So to join the boot camps extra hour session tonight, please uh, keep that in the back of your mind. Please download the free book and, of course, download the free guide on how to become an architect. Let me try to get to some questions that I can. Does block storage have a life cycle policy? Not really, because it's your hard drive in your computer. How do you determine in your computer what you're not going to need? A lot of things on your hard drive you may actually need. They could be an application library that you might not use for a month, but do you want to remove it from your hard drive? So not typically. Okay, so I know I covered a lot today. I covered direct connections. I covered VPNs. I covered the organization of the cloud, how it's organized, the way it's organized. We covered storage of all kinds. We went way beyond the associate by getting into RAID and RAID types. Here's what I'm going to recommend. I covered so much so fast. If you have the opportunity to rewatch this before tomorrow, I encourage you to do so. I would actually get into new content today, but I don't want to go too long. Let me just see. Before I make a decision. You know what? Let me get into compute. And that way, if I get a little jump on it, there's a chance we'll be finished on Friday instead of going into the weekend. So... Let's talk about computing on the AWS platform. What is the cloud? Remember, everybody, it's just someone else's data center. And what exists in a data center? Servers, storage, routers, switches, load balancer, that kind of thing. So let's talk a little bit about compute. In general, we're either going to have a bare metal server or we're going to have a virtual machine for 90% of our computational things or containers. And AWS made up a name for the virtual machine. They call it an elastic compute cloud. All it really is is a virtual machine, the same virtual machine that VMware invented in 1999 with their hypervisor, but AWS makes their own hypervisor, similar technology. And when you get a virtual machine, you're going to have to size it the same way you would size any other virtual machine in the world, which means how many computational cores do you need? What is the frequency of them? Are they at 1.9 gigahertz or are they 3.6 gigahertz? The amount of memory in the virtual machine, the storage performance, and the network performance. This is how we size any virtual machine, whether it's an Azure virtual machine, a Google Compute Engine instance, an AWS EC2 instance, an Oracle virtual machine, or a VMware virtual machine, or a KVM or a QEM virtual machine. So same thing. Now, see what I, when you deal with AWS, they have pre-sized I instances mean this, G instances mean this, and they would encourage you to look at them. I encourage you to not look at them. They are marketing numbers. They might call an I series a virtual compute, but 
I want you to actually go back and look at the processors. What do I mean by this? The i3 series that they have are, are Xeon E526, I think 70 something V3s, which is an eight year old processor being sold as general purpose computer. Now, what happens if you go from the data center on a modern processor and you, you adopt that AWS i series processor, which is eight years old? The performance of the cores might not be the same. So you might have a modern processor where two cores equals eight cores on that old virtual machine because of advancements in caching technologies, DRAM speed, and a few other things. So, you know, keep it in mind, you really need to look at the cores, at the available DRAM, at the storage performance, at the drive performance, and processor performance to match your systems from the data center and the cloud. Now, EC2 instances by default support your main operating systems. What are they? They are Linux. Most servers on the internet are Linux whether they be Ubuntu or Red Hat Linux. Now there is also a Mac mini that is available to rent as an EC2 instance. And this is not for high availability, high performance systems. Mac minis do not have error correcting RAM and they are not architected for high availability, but they are perfect for a developer that might need a Mac mini virtual machine to compile some AWS code. <laughs> So we can talk about that. So when you deal with a virtual machine on AWS, you can use a pre-built one or you can make your own. So pre-built ones, you can typically go to the AWS marketplace. You need a high performance firewall. You're not gonna use AWS WAF. You're gonna go and get a performance firewall which sits on a virtual machine from the marketplace. From, from a, maybe it's from Checkpoint, from Palo Alto, from Fortinet or from Cisco. Pre-made virtual machine image. You can also build your own. You can start with a base image and you can install any software you want on it, just like you could in a data center. And you can also take a virtual machine that you already have in your data center and use a conversion tool to take your VMware virtual machine and turn it into an AWS virtual machine. So kind of think about that. You can upload your virtual servers from say VMware. You can take your physical server and turn it into, in your data center, turn it into a virtual machine and move the thing to the cloud. It is really simple and easy. When it comes to Amazon Elastic Compute Clouds, they come in what something's called an AMI. Now you can take your system, you can image it, and you can make your own AMI, or you can launch a pre-made AMI. All in Amazon Machine Images is just an image of your system. It includes an operating system, it includes launch permissions, and it includes a block device mapping that's going to map specific volumes to your systems. I could take an AMI in the US region and copy it into an Asian region, and I could use it for disaster recovery or to migrate to a new region. And Amazon Linux 2 and Amazon Linux AMIs are pre built. You've got them from Ubuntu. Amazon Linux, for those of you that are unfamiliar, is going to look and feel a lot like. Red Hat Linux, other than it's not going to have the Red Hat support. But, you know, it's great Linux. And of course, when you built up a Linux system, they're going to come up with nothing. So you can, you can ha take any of these virtual machines and you can create something called the bootstrap strip. So a bootstrap strip will basically tell the virtual machine to maybe update itself and install applications. So, for example, I can have an Ubuntu virtual machine. And as soon as it boots, I can do a sudo app dash get upgrade, update, to update the operating system patches. I could do a sudo apt install HTTPD or Apache or something like that to install a web server. And the system will come online. It will patch itself. And then after it patches itself, it will install all the applications I need. And I would do that on a Linux system all day long. Not going to be done on a Windows server. Of course, Windows, you use a PowerShell script. Basically, you're writing a bash shell script that you're doing for the for the virtual machine. It's called uh, they call it uh, a bootstrap script. Simple, basic script. Now, when it comes to our instances, we've got some choices, and we have to choose the select option. On demand. Basically, today, right now, Cindy the cat wants to create a virtual machine because she wants to start building a website for Cindy's tuna to the tuna.com. Perfect for on demand. 
Now, because it's on demand, I'm going to be paying by the second. And I'm going to be paying a lot by the second for these virtual machines based upon the size. But if I don't know the capacity I have, which I should never be in a condition where I don't know unless it's brand new, on demand is perfect. I get what I need for as long as I need it. But I'm going to pay for that agility. Now, let's say I want to use that virtual machine and I know I need it for three years. Now I can reserve it and I can tell Amazon, I am going to buy this virtual machine with 16 cores and 64 gigs of RAM and I will use it for a year or three years. And by doing so, I'm guaranteeing Amazon revenue. I'm guaranteeing to pay them and they're going to give me a discount for that. So that's called the reserved instance. So on demand is going to be the most expensive and the most agile. Get it when you need it. Perfect for auto scaling. Perfect when you don't know. Reserved is I know what I need and I know I need it for one year, three years, and I'm going to pay for it. Let's talk about another option to reduce our cost. Let's talk about scheduled reserved. What if I know my organization needs to do a batch job every Saturday and it's going to run for 24 hours and I'm going to need 50 servers? And they're going to run hard for 24 hours and they're not going to need them. Well, I could do what's called the scheduled reserve. I can guarantee to Amazon that every week for the next three years, I'm going to buy this. And they'll give me a discount. And it'll be cheaper than on demand. The last kind of instance pricing we have is kind of the riskiest. And it's called spot instances. So what is a spot instance? Let's say you're Amazon, and if you ever saw the movie Field of Dreams when they say, build it, and they will come, build it, and they will come, well, that's Amazon. They've got these monstrous daybreak centers, and they built it, and they're waiting for people to come. So often, they have a ton of unused capacity, and that's what the spot instance is. Like, if you want to get compute capacity on the cheap, you bid on it and say, here, I'm willing to pay this to use your systems for this. And Amazon will say yes, okay, or no. And here's the thing. You bid on unused capacity. I agree to pay you three cents per period of time. Now somebody else says, I'm gonna bid four cents. You're kicked out. So the spot instance is great when you need to compute capacity, but they can shut you off at any moment. So, I'm doing something, it's not super important, I can start and stop it. Spot instances are great. Do not put your business on a spot instance because the second you do for normal computer, normal systems that have to run, and somebody agrees to pay more than you, you are done, you are out of business, which is absolutely no good. So, it could be very useful. There's a time and a place for the spot instance. And best pricing is gonna be when you use, on the, when you reserve what you know, what you can't reserve weekly, but you can reserve on scheduled reserve is good. On demand for what you need, because that's not going to be shut off. And if you've got a big batch job that you need a lot of compute capacity for, use a spot instance. And now you kind of understand why, why you have these different instance person syndromes. So the last thing I want to talk about is tenancy. In other words, tenancy is really where's your stuff, where's your machines located? So normally speaking, you've got shared tenancy. And what does this mean? You got an AWS server and you are there, your competitors are on the same server, their competitors are on the same server, 10 other businesses, 20 other businesses are all on the same server as you. Does it matter? Probably not, but that's shared tenancy. The hypervisor is managing the security. Now, by comparison, you have no knowledge of that server. So let's say your server's got 128 cores in it. Amazon could actually sell 200 cores on your server. Why? Chances are all of you won't use all your cores at the same time, and that's called oversubscription. You might not want that. You probably never notice it, but you know they could do that as well. I'm not saying they do or don't, but people oversubscribe all the time in the service provider business. And if you're on the shared tenancy, you've got no control. So now let's get into the dedicated instances. And this is basically where you get your own plain, clean server, and it's only your stuff on it. So there you go.
Very simple. Poof. Simple. Easy. Dedicated instance, meaning that entire server itself is yours, but only your, your system, but it's still in that AWS hypervisor, AWS managed environment. Now, that means only your virtual machines will be on the same server. But what if you need more control? What if you actually need to see the hardware? What if you've got the license that's looking for the processor serial number or something like that? That's when you get a dedicated host, which is a bare metal server, which means you can put whatever you want on it. And that's how you get close to the performance of a data center. So now, how do we lock our systems down? Well, when you're dealing with the virtual machine, you're going to have to secure that virtual machine, too. AWS does not talk about that in any of their certifications, including the security one. But they do talk about how do you protect traffic going into your system. So we'll talk about that. Virtual, the virtual machines in AWS basically do the following. They enable you to create a host-based firewall on the way in with something called the security group. And that enables you to say, allow traffic from this subnet on this port to reach this system. So you can secure your virtual machines by, quite simply, using a security group. That's what AWS teaches you on the way in. Look, when it comes to server hardening, there's patches that need to be done. There's packages that need to be removed. There's host-based firewalls, IDS, IPS systems. The security group is one of maybe 30 to 100 different things that you actually need to do. But it's the one they talk about, so let's talk about that. So the security group is basically a host-based firewall. Now, how do your virtual machines get an IP address? How does an EC2 instance get an address? Well, you put a it comes with a network interface, an elastic network interface. And each one gets an IP address and it's assigned via DHCP. Now, every interface in your VPC, every is going to be on unique address space. You've got a server with two Ethernet cards in it or two elastic network cards. Same thing as two Ethernet cards, just logical versus physical. They each need to be on a different subnet. And when the systems get assigned an IP address, they will get a DNS name assigned from AWS DNS, and that means you can attach to it via a fully qualified domain name, cindy.gocloudcareers.com. That's a fully qualified domain name. And of course, we can use a public address if the things need to be reachable from the internet, and we use private addresses if they don't need to be reachable from the internet. Private IP addresses will be there for systems that you want protected from the internet, can't be reachable. Now, instances are going to be automatically assigned an IPv6 address at launch. If you don't use IPv6, shut it down. It's another place where you can be hacked. And you can manually disable this at launch. So how are you going to manage and access your systems? Very simply. You can, you can go straight to the EC2 console, like the AWS Management Console. You can secure Shell. SSH, like we've done for decades, into Linux machines, same way you would do with your Linux machines here. You could use RDP or the remote desktop protocol to get into Windows systems, just like you would in any data center. And of course, you can manage some of this from the software development kit. Now, the next thing we're going to talk about, and it's the last type of compute, is called an AWS outpost. Now, if you want, an, if you want a virtual machine, or systems, you can call Dell, IBM, HP, and they'll ship you a server. You can pop any hypervisor you want on it, VMware, Citrix N, Linux KVM, and you can run it all in your data center. The alternative is you can call AWS and they will ship you a very expensive outpost. And the outpost is nothing more than a server with the AWS hypervisor on it. And then, you can use the AWS Management Console to set up your virtual machines like in the data center like they are on the cloud. And that gives you high performance in your data center because now you're not going to, you don't have to go to a local zone. It's all in your data center, which offers the highest performance. But it may cost you a lot more than just buying a server from Dell, IBM, or HP and sticking it in your data center because you're paying for somebody else to manage it for you. 
So keep that in the back of your mind. Outpost is an option to run a regular server inside your data center, which is connected to the AWS cloud. Of course, a hybrid cloud gives you all that plus more control and lower costs. It is up to you to determine how you want to use it. But it is a great option for people that don't have the sophistication to manage the servers themselves to use the AWS management console, the AWS tools, and have some low latency gear in their data center as well as connect to the cloud. Well, well, now we talked about the compute options that are there in AWS. So I'm going to stop here. If any questions popped in in the last few minutes, I'm, I'm pretty happy to deal with them. And otherwise, to, uh, we'll, we'll deal with the rest of the questions on Zoom tonight. The EBS volumes are local to the availability zone. But if you've got IP connectivity to it, you can and you create a share in an EBS volume, you'll be able to reach it anywhere else, just like any other server. But your EBS volumes are going to be local. You're going to want the networking performance to do so. You can create a snapshot of your EBS volume and launch that in another region, absolutely, or availability zone. Okay, so we will end here, and I hope to see many of you on Zoom. So please download a copy of the free AWS exam guide. It'll help you there with the exam, and it'll cover more things that we weren't able to cover completely over here, and it's the perfect combination. Please join us tonight so we can help you on your questions in the free Zoom session. And please, if you have any desires to become a cloud architect, please get to how to become a cloud architect uh, guide. It's a free ebook we wrote for you. The certification is maybe 3% of all the skills that need to be learned. The rest of them are business skills and leadership skills and system design skills and networking and data center skills. And we'll tell you all of them. So look forward to meeting you all tonight. Hope you all had fun. I had fun with you. Got to speak with people all around the world. And it's just under an hour from now. So it's just long enough to fill up your coffee cup or your tea cup, depending upon where you are. And then we all get to meet and speak face-to-face -face regardless of where in the world. Take care. Can't wait to see you in a little bit.